This is Audible. Harper Audio presents The Duke is Mine by Eloisa James Performed by Susan Dewarden Chapter 17 For Better, For Poorer, In Sickness and In Health Georgiana was a very restful companion. They strolled to the bottom of the garden, where there was a little bench. Georgiana was as fascinated by the composition of light in terms of waves and particles as he was. It was a real pleasure to talk the question through. Quinn didn't even notice that it had grown a bit chilly until he inadvertently touched her arm and found it icy. "'Miss Georgiana, you seem to be very cold. We should return to the house.' She ignored him. I wonder whether it would influence the experiment if you slanted the paper that you are using to split the light into rainbows. What do you mean? Well, if I understood you correctly, you are holding a card with a vertical slit up to the window. He nodded. As the light strikes the slit, it divides into a rainbow, thereby demonstrating that light is made up of rays rather than particles, though it is not clear to me why the rays evidence themselves merely because they went through a slit in paper. It may be because the rays bend as they go through, though, to be truthful, I'm not sure. What if the slit ran from corner to corner? Would the rays bend in the same fashion? What if the slit were parallel with the window frame rather than vertical? What happens then? He paused. I don't know he said finally. But it's a very good point. I shall try that tomorrow. He put a hand under her chilly elbow and helped her to her feet. I am growing cold as well. Georgiana smiled up at him. I didn't notice because our conversation had been so interesting. She took his arm and they began to walk back to the house. There was a contented silence between them. Quinn was thinking furiously about the alignment of slits in relation to light, and Georgiana didn't seem to mind the quiet. A patter of feet interrupted his thoughts, and he looked up, just as Olivia burst around the curve in the path. He wasn't any good at describing such things, but her gown was made of a dull gold stuff covered in lace that went sideways. The lace was composed of little strings— Thousands of little strings that dared a man to run his fingers around her. The string swayed when she ran. Just like that, his body went from chilled to hot. Heat sang to a pulse of blood raging through his body. Georgie, Olivia said. Your grace, she dropped into a curtsy. Georgiana's fingers tightened on his arm. I'm sorry that you had to fetch me, Olivia. We were having a discussion about the scientific basis of light. Of course you were. Olivia's smile was wide and utterly natural, until you looked at her eyes. Or did he imagine that flash of possessiveness? Quinn deliberately put his other hand on top of Georgiana's fingers. We were having such a fascinating conversation that regretfully I allowed your sister to grow quite chilled. Georgiana glanced up at him her eyes unreadable, and then back to her sister. We are just returning to the house, Olivia. Thank you for coming to fetch me. I apologize for interrupting your conversation, Olivia said, her tone perfectly friendly. She fell back and walked at Georgiana's side. Did I hear you call your sister Georgie? Quinn asked, looking across at her. Yes, Olivia said. It's my pet name for her. Goodness, it is cold out here, isn't it? I can almost see my breath. She took a breath and huffed. Georgiana laughed. Don't be silly, Olivia. In order to condense the moisture in your breath sufficiently to be visible, it must be far colder outside than this. Quinn dimly registered Georgiana's response, but he couldn't find a way to bring words to his mouth. Whenever Olivia took a deep breath, her breasts strained against those delicate strings of lace. It seemed to him that a few of those strings were all that prevented her nipples from being exposed to every man in the ballroom. A growl rose in his throat, and he choked it back. I like the name Georgie, he said. 
the words came with a husky intonation that sounded as if he meant something entirely different by them. Georgiana, Georgie, looked up at him with a surprised smile, and Olivia blinked and looked away. They both heard his voice, and they both misunderstood. Well, he said briskly, I suggest that we go straight to the library and bake ourselves before the fireplace, before we join everyone in the ballroom. Oh, I'm not cold at all, Olivia said lightly. I'll warm up dancing. They were approaching the short set of stairs that led to the marble terrace. The very idea of Olivia in the arms of another man went through him like a sword. It only took one smooth motion. He politely ushered Georgiana onto a step before him, slipped to the side, and stepped forward quite precisely so that his foot descended on the train of her gown, pinning her to the stair. Then he threw his weight forward, appearing to trip. The scientist in him was quite satisfied by the prolonged ripping sound that resulted. Swallowing a smile, he flowed into a smooth series of apologies, surprisingly fluent for him. Georgiana remained calm, although many a lady would have been in hysterics. The seam at the waist of her gown had separated and now gaped open, revealing her chemise. "'I'll walk behind you,' Olivia said to her sister. "'We only have to make our way through the room and then straight up the stairs.' "'Nonsense,' Quinn said. "'I did the damage, and I'll carry you to your chamber. "'Miss Georgiana, you have turned your ankle.' He picked her up and discovered she weighed almost nothing. It was like picking up a bird, all hollow bones and feathers. Georgiana didn't squeal, but she sucked in an anxious breath. "'Olivia, you'll have to accompany us.' Quinn said, over his shoulder. I can carry your sister upstairs, but I need you with me as chaperone. Without waiting for an answer, he walked through the open doors. A rising spiral of conversation greeted them as people inquired what mishap had felled Georgiana. It's just a tanned ankle, Olivia kept saying, walking just in front of them. I'm perfectly fine, Georgiana said, her voice as tranquil as ever. In fact, I think I shall rest briefly, and then return to the ballroom. I shall deliver you to your maid, Quinn announced, making sure all in the near vicinity heard him. You may, of course, make up your own mind about whether you feel it advisable to return. One wouldn't want to see you dance on an injured ankle, Miss Georgiana. This flummery got them to the bottom of the stairs. Quinn started climbing, thinking about the difference between the sisters— Georgiana felt like a bundle of feathers in his arms, whereas the idea of holding Olivia like this, carrying her upstairs to the bedroom. He walked faster. When they reached the top of the stairs, he moved to the side to allow Olivia to go before them. As soon as they were inside Georgiana's bedchamber, she politely but firmly freed herself and dropped a perfectly calibrated curtsy. I thank you very much for rescuing me, Your Grace. I am happy to be of service. After all, it was I who was responsible for your predicament. And I think we should be on a first-name basis, he said, picking up her hand and kissing it. My intimates call me Quinn. There was an odd look to her eyes, one he couldn't interpret, not the way he could read Olivia's. May I call you Georgie? The name suits you. She nodded. I would be honoured. Then she turned to her sister. Olivia, I'll join you downstairs in a half hour or so. Thank you again, Your Grace. My name is Quinn, he insisted. She really was a somber young woman. Her smile came nowhere near her eyes. Of course, she agreed. Then she closed the door in their faces. Olivia stared, frowning at the door but Quinn didn't give a damn about what Georgiana was feeling or thinking. He gave one swift look about and found to his deep satisfaction that there was no one within sight and no one could see them from below. His hand closed on Olivia's like a vice and he pulled her down the corridor, flung open the door to his bedchamber and hauled her inside like a recalcitrant child. Just what do you think you're doing? She demanded in a harsh whisper. Quinn not only knew exactly what he was thinking, but he knew what she was thinking too. She could protest all she wished, but he had learned to read her eyes. 
Without a word, he closed the door and backed her against it, and bent his head to her mouth, spurring the wild, searing passion that always flared between them. Gwen, she gasped, but he was tilting her head to the side, unable to think, his entire body just a fierce ball of want. He throbbed to touch her, to have her, to be inside her. I need you, he said haltingly. He shaped his hands around her bottom and pulled her up, closer to him, molding her luscious body to his. Olivia. Her name came out low and deep, like a plea or a prayer. She was on tiptoes, kissing him back, and still it wasn't enough. With a smooth swirl, he plucked her from her place against the door and placed her on his bed. He lowered himself on top of her slowly, making sure that every inch of him was against her softness, watching her to see that she understood what he was doing. She made a sweet, inarticulate sound, more like a gasp, but she didn't say a word. Then she was kissing him, too, and her body was soft under his muscled thighs, her fingers locked in his hair. They stayed there, not moving much, for long minutes. It wasn't kissing the way Quinn ever thought of kissing. He thought he knew exactly what a kiss was. A caress of the lips that might or might not involve an exploration of the recipient's mouth by the giver's tongue. None of that made any sense compared to this. This was an inferno and a conversation all at once. He felt every touch with double ferocity— the way her fingers caressed his hair and then clenched almost painfully if he nudged forward with his hips. Her breath, sweet and smelling of tea and lemons, the little sounds she made in the back of her throat, urging him on, telling him without words that... He reared up, looking down at her, running a possessive hand down her neck, her shoulders trailing onto her breast. He felt her shudder under his touch. She opened her mouth, about to speak, so he put a finger across her lips. The tip of her tongue stole out and touched his finger. He pressed back, just a little, allowed his finger to slip through soft lips into liquid warmth. The groan was torn from his chest, reverberated through his entire body. It crystallized his thoughts. I will not marry Georgiana. It was blunt, because he wasn't good at words, even though he was a little more fluent around Olivia. Somehow, he could talk to her. Her eyes flew open, and her whole body went rigid. Oh, God! I'm the worst sister in the world! Let me up! He shook his head, dragging his thumb along the curve of her jaw. Your skin is beautiful. I feel sick to my stomach, she said, fierce and low. And you, you're seducing me. Yes. Stop it, and let me up. Reluctantly, he rolled to the side, but kept his arm across her body. I can't marry her, and it has nothing to do with you. Liar! She glared at him, and he took a moment to savour it. Olivia was like a flame. Actually, I never lie. You're lying now. If you had never met me, you would have married Georgie and been happy as two bedbugs in a mattress, or, more to the point, two alchemists in a laboratory. I can't know for certain, of course, but I don't think so. It wasn't until my mother brought Lady Althea and Miss Georgiana here that I realized I could not simply marry whomever she chose for me. She chose rightly, Olivia said, stubborn as ever. You're perfect for each other. This thing between us is nothing more than a forest fire, as you described it. Temporary. It will burn itself out. Let me rise, please. I don't believe that I know what love is. At least the sort that people talk about between men and women. But I would venture to say that some people characterize the feeling I had for Evangelina's love. I think care about is a more accurate description especially if one understands the phrase to include an abiding desire. She stilled, raised a hand, touched his cheek. I'm sorry. It wasn't a good marriage. She wasn't in love with me.
and she had a deep urge to be with other men. It was problematic. But I cared about her, even when she made me a cuckold and finally left me. I couldn't stop. Stupid, I know. Olivia leaned over and gave him a kiss that clung to his lips. Actually, you should be proud of your loyalty. You are wonderful, Quinn. No, I'm quite foolish. I should have stopped myself, somehow. I don't think anyone has the ability to choose whether or not to fall in love. Exactly, he said with deep satisfaction. I agree with you. When I told you that I don't lie, I meant it. She shook her head. I must return downstairs in case Georgie decides to rejoin the ball. I am telling you something. He tried to remember what it was, but it felt as if his entire body was focused on the plump, sweet curves of her lips. You never lie, she said, sitting up and breaking their eye contact. I accept that. I'm not good at interpreting complex statements. She pulled up her knees, wound her arms around them, and then rested her chin on them, looking at him curiously. And yet, you're the most intelligent person I've ever met. Only because you haven't been to university. She gave a deep chuckle. Most people would prevaricate on hearing that compliment, and insist that I was exaggerating. As I said, I don't lie. The possibility is extremely good that I am the most intelligent person you've met. But that doesn't mean I'm the wisest. Witness the fact that I cared so deeply for Evangeline. A fact that proves you human. It's a miserable way to achieve humanity, he said wryly. My point is that I couldn't say those vows without meaning them. Vows? Her eyes changed. Oh, the marriage vows. To have and to hold, he quoted, to love and to cherish till death us do part. She swallowed. Poor Evangeline. She's in the past now, and he meant that. But I can't say those words to just anyone. They mean a great deal to me. They're powerful. Even though Evangeline was not respectful of those vows. Yes. Do you know how she died? Olivia hugged her knees more closely. No. She was leaving me. She had decided to run away to France with her current lover, a scrap of absurdity named Sir Bartholomew Fopling. Olivia choked. I'm not joking, he said. Fopling was a most gifted man. He could sing in any number of languages, dance everything worth dancing, and his cravats were always pressed. At any rate, she and Fopling took Alfie with them. He stopped and cleared his throat. They left for France, even though a storm was brewing. They were warned not to embark, but Evangeline bribed the captain. She was terrified that I was following her, that I would catch her. Are you sure you wish to tell me this? Why not? It's no more than your maid would tell you, if you asked. And were you following her? I almost killed my horse riding him hard. But I was too late. The devil of it is that I still dream of that pier. I'd missed them, and the only thing I could see was the sea, boiling with whitecaps. The boat went down only a mile or two from shore. There was a moment of silence. I suppose, Olivia said slowly, that a future duchess should not engage in profanity, especially with regard to the dead. So I would say, Quinn, while avoiding curses, that your wife was an ass. He could feel a twisted little smile on his lips. It was a long time ago. Five years. Practically a lifetime. Nonsense, she said. One never gets over the loss of a loved one, especially a child. There was no point in answering that comment. It was cruelly true. At any rate, I can't marry Georgiana. Then he added, 
just so she understood. Eva. I think you could grow to love her, or care about her, if you prefer that term. Evangeline was not faithful to me, but I was to her. I was so feverishly in lust with her that there were times when I doubted my own ability to maintain my self-control, though, of course, I did. A shadow crossed her eyes. Evangeline threw away something that every woman in this kingdom would love to have. She didn't deserve it. Deserve it or not, she had it. When I carried your sister up those stairs, I didn't feel even a shadow of desire. She frowned at him. Georgie has a perfect figure. In fact, she's perfect in every way. It felt as if I were carrying a child up the stairs, all long legs and hair. She's elegant, Olivia stated. I would kill to have her figure. Really? Of course. I have always wished to look precisely like her, though obviously not enough to avoid food, she added. That's madness. You have everything she doesn't. Olivia opened her mouth, ready to argue. Everything she hasn't. She frowned at him. Including me. Chapter 18 Madness in All Its Forms Quinn's last two words, spoken with the reasoned calm that characterized him, shook Olivia to her core. What? she whispered. What are you saying? I'm saying that I care about you. Embarrassingly, I seem to care about you more than I did Evangeline. It may be that I am mad. He paused, considering... I don't perceive any other signs of mental weakness, though, so I am inclined to simply acknowledge this as a human weakness. I am reluctant to label it a failing. She shook her head, dazed. It could be that I am merely the sort of man who is ruled by lust. Olivia took a deep breath. I am honoured by what you said. I assure you that no woman dislikes being told she is an object of desire— but you must listen to me, Quinn. I will not betray Rupert by leaving him while he is overseas in battle. More to the point, I will never betray my sister. You sat out there in the garden with her for almost an hour. You carried her up the stairs. You courted her. I was no more courteous to her than I would be to any other young woman under my roof. Sitting on a bench for almost an hour? I can't envision you doing that with any of your other guests. Your sister is remarkably intelligent. We talked about science. It is a pleasure to converse with her. However, a forty-five-minute conversation does not require that I marry her. Put together with everything else, it means that she has a reasonable expectation of marrying you, and I will not ever stand in the way of her wish. If the two of you do not marry, for whatever reason, so be it. I will never have it be said that I stole her chosen husband. She stood up. I must pin up my hair. He came at her in a low, silent rush, a surge of power and speed. Don't marry me, he said, holding her tightly. I won't. But he heard the catch in her voice. Just don't pretend that you don't want to, that there is nothing between us that is far beyond what I shared with Evangeline, you with Montsori, or even you with your sister. Olivia's heart pounded in her chest so loudly that she thought he must be able to hear it as well. I don't think it matters. It doesn't matter! He bellowed it. What matters more than that? What? Hush! She said sharply. I'll be forced to marry you if we're caught here, and I shan't forgive you for it. He jerked her a touch closer, so that her body was flattened against his. You don't know what I mean, because you have never lost someone. There is nothing that matters more, not science, nor mathematical propositions, not my title and my lands. Nothing. There's honour, she said, feeling pain arrow into her heart. My honour. I can't betray my sister or Rupert. Something changed in his eyes. 
Your love is not so boundless as the sea, or so deep. I never said that I loved you at all, let alone to the tune of those metaphors, she said, keeping her voice steady. I hardly know you. His fingers tightened on her hips, as if he were going to argue with her. Olivia felt a quiver deep inside. He knew what she felt for him. But he let go. My mother has always said that I'm a hopeless fool when it comes to emotion. I rarely feel it, and when I do, it's like a kind of madness. Olivia shook out her skirts, avoiding his eyes. She had the same madness, though she couldn't say that. If she did, he would take her. She could see it in his eyes. He would bellow, mine, and summon the whole party to the room. And she would have to live with wounding and betraying her own sister. No. I am retiring to my chamber for a few moments, and then I'll return downstairs, she stated. If you would be so kind as to return to the ball now, there is a chance that no one will notice that we were both missing. He bowed, and she walked past him, closing the door quietly behind her. Olivia's pulse didn't slow until Nora had pinned up her hair again and she'd walked back to her sister's room. Georgie? Georgiana was sitting by the fireplace, reading a book, the very picture of serenity. Has it been long enough that I can go back downstairs now? I believe that you have rested your ankle sufficiently, Olivia said, managing a smile. You don't think that I must pretend to limp, do you? No, of course not. You bathed your foot in vinegar and cool water, though naturally you won't be so indelicate as to mention the particulars, and it felt well immediately. Perhaps you shouldn't dance, though. That will not be a sacrifice. I don't like to dance. Georgiana got up and smoothed her hair before the glass. You don't like to dance? Olivia asked, surprised. I had no idea. I am discovering that there are aspects to being a duchess that I do not enjoy, her sister replied, turning about. Dancing, for example. And I don't enjoy chatting about embroidery either, as with Althea's mother this afternoon, for two hours. You chatted, Olivia said. I lapsed into something akin to a stupor. If there had been a coffin available, I would have flung myself into it. Olivia laughed. Georgie, you're not yourself. I think I am becoming myself. Georgiana didn't laugh. In the garden, I talked with the Duke about the composition of light. Olivia's laughter dried up instantly. Of course, and that was far more interesting than embroidery. Of course it was. It's not fair that I can't go to university, her sister replied her eyes fierce as a falcon's with a string on its leg. I could do that, Olivia. I could do it as well as he. Maybe better. Really? Her sister nodded curtly. I don't know anything, nearly as much. But it would just be a matter of study. Like learning to be a duchess, but so much more interesting. It was a cry wrung from her soul. Olivia stopped short. Are you saying that you learned how to be a duchess only because that was the available subject of study? Georgiana walked past her, into the corridor. You're always too emotional. We were given a task. We could do it badly or well. I chose to do it well. You allowed emotion to get in the way of achievement. Olivia followed and caught her hand. Georgie! Yes? Her sister's eyes were cool. Are you angry at me? At that, they softened. No, not in the least. I'm angry about the fact that I was trained to be the wife of a duke. Even if I had been trained to be the wife of a scientist, it wouldn't be good enough. You want to be the scientist. A jerky nod. I enjoyed talking to the duke, but at the same time... I felt such resentment that I could have choked on it. Olivia leaned forward, kissed her cheek. You could study anything you wish, Georgie.
Her sister shrugged, an unrefined gesture that revealed more than words that she was on the verge of cracking under the strain. I mean it, Olivia continued, closing the bedchamber door behind them. What on earth do you need a university for? Everything is printed in books, and we can get whatever books you want to read. You mean, you and Rupert? Exactly. And we could ask a professor to come from Oxford or Cambridge. We'll pay him to teach you anything you can't get from the books. You'll learn like lightning, Georgie. I could, her voice rose. I really could. After you marry Sconce, you can buy whatever books you wish, not to mention discussing the ideas with him. It hardly need be said that neither Rupert nor I can provide you with any sort of serious intellectual conversation. Georgiana started down the corridor, but paused. I know I told you he was perfect, Olivia. But he's not. There's no spark. None. Perhaps... Over time, Olivia said, forcing the words out. I thought, I truly thought that when I met the ideal man, I would feel something, a wish to be with him, passion, love, whatever you want to call it. At first, I believed that's what I was experiencing with Sconce. I do like talking to him, but I don't wish to call him by that ridiculous short name of his, Quinn. You don't like his name? Georgiana began walking down the stairway. It sounds like a piece of fruit to me, a quince by any other name. Olivia stared at her back, pushing away the liquid, joyful feeling of relief that was flooding her entire body. And even if his appearance wasn't a cross between a zebra and a quince, Georgiana said over her shoulder, he doesn't look at me the way he looks at you. He doesn't, Olivia said weakly. Georgiana turned around at the bottom of the stairs. I'm not stupid, she pointed out, unnecessarily. I may have wanted to marry Sconce before I came to know him better, but even if I did still wish to marry him, which I do not, I am not a bone you can throw to him simply because you feel too guilty to act on your own feelings. I don't think of you as a bone. Her sister's eyes sharpened. If you want him, Olivia Lytton, take him. He's a duke, for goodness sake. You have a chance to make mother and yourself happy. Rupert will come back one of these days, and his brain won't be any more powerful than when he left this country. What on earth are you waiting for? Rupert, Olivia said weakly. I can't betray Rupert. You would betray Rupert if you gave Lucy to a passing tinker. Personally, I think it's unlikely that he would grieve for more than five minutes over the prospect of not marrying you. I thought, Olivia's throat swelled, I thought it would betray you. Georgiana's smile was brilliant. If I wanted him, I would have dueled you for him, rapiers at dawn. But I don't. Olivia snatched her into a hug, careful not to muss her hair, and said, We'll dower you, Georgie. You know that. Yes, Georgiana said. She looked happier than she had in years as they walked in the door of the ballroom. You had better do that, because in case you're wondering, I am not going to step into your shoes and marry Rupert. I still feel queasy thinking about that scene in the library. I'd rather stay an old maid. If I can find enough books to read, I shall do just that. You can do whatever you wish, Olivia said, feverish heat racing over her body. One of us sacrificed on the ducal altar is enough. Georgiana broke into a merry peal of laughter that made two gentlemen turn and look. If you're sacrificing yourself, then we should all be so lucky. Olivia felt her cheeks heating up. I know. Her sister put a fleeting finger on her cheek. You deserve it, after all the kindnesses you've shown Rupert. We can find him a wife, you know. Not Althea, but someone with understanding and kindness. And enough intelligence to run the estate, Olivia said. But do you really think... Georgiana grinned and then glanced to the side. Dear me, 
It looks as if the Duke is dancing with Annabel Trevelyan. Now she would love to become his Duchess. Olivia spun, heard her sister's chuckle, saw Quinn leaning against the wall, staring moodily at the dancers. He remains where he can see you, Georgiana said into her ear. And if you walked through the room and into the library, he would follow. I wouldn't dare, Olivia said, her heart in her throat. Is this the bravest woman I know? Georgiana scoffed. The woman who entered Father's study with Rupert, knowing that the next few hours would include the most unpleasant experience any woman could endure. You have courage, Olivia. Use it. Olivia took a deep breath. At that moment, Quinn turned his head. Georgiana was right. He was checking to see where she was. He loved her. Or rather, to put it his way, he cared about her. Rather blindly, she walked deeper into the room, trailed by the sound of Georgiana's laughter. At just the right moment, she looked at Quinn and let an invitation speak through her eyes. He straightened instantly, and his eyes flared in response. So she moved on, weaving through the room, pausing to respond to greetings, extracting herself as soon as she could, declining to dance. It was like a game, the most thrilling game she had ever played. Quinn was surely behind her, following her. She would have wagered her life that he couldn't resist the look she'd given him. Power was intoxicating, it sang in her blood, made her knees unsteady. At the other end of the ballroom she went straight to the door that led into the library, opened it, and walked through. The room was quiet, empty except for a footman. The Duchess did not believe that her guests should be given the opportunity for dalliance, and to that end posted servants in each room. Olivia nodded to him. Roberts! Are you having a quiet night? The footman relaxed his rigid pose, recognizing her. Three couples so far, he said, a grin splitting his face. Let me guess. The betting book is in play? For each room, he said. Tuppence a room. I wagered five couples would try for this one. The door behind her opened quietly. She didn't have to turn. The air changed when he was near. Roberts, Quinn said. His deep voice sent shivers down her spine. Her grace, doubtless, has some use of you in the back of the house. Roberts was too well trained to show even a flicker of curiosity. He bowed and left as quietly as Quinn had entered. Only then did Olivia turn. He was magnificent, wide shoulders appearing even larger in a dark blue superfine coat that brought out the green of his eyes. The look in those eyes had her retreating a step. Quinn, she squeaked, breathless, silly, like a girl of thirteen. You summoned me, he said, direct as always. And here I am, Olivia. I hope you meant it, because I think I shall never be able to resist you. She couldn't think what to say. He was so beautiful, lean and powerful and muscled. Even his hair was extraordinary. Whereas she was plump and ordinary. He closed the space between them in one stride. Having him so close just made the contrast between them even more obvious. This was impossible. He took her hands in his and raised them to his lips sending another shiver down Olivia's spine. I'm fat, she blurted out. You are not fat. You're the most beautiful, voluptuous woman I know. His eyes moved down her body, deliberately, slowly, then back to her face. What she saw in them sent fire squirming through her stomach and lower. I want every inch of you, he said, growling it. I want to fall on my knees and worship at your hips. He reached out, shaped her curves from breast to hips with a burning sweep of his hand that a man was allowed to give only his wife. But Olivia couldn't bear it if he found himself regretful later, if she ever saw the disenchantment in his eyes that she saw so constantly in her mother's. She hurried on. 
I won't make a very good duchess. I don't think the dowager likes me very much. She would prefer that you marry Georgiana. In fact, I'm fairly sure that she would be appalled by the very idea of your marrying me. That's precisely why my estate came equipped with a dower house. I am not marrying my mother. I am marrying you. Quinn's grey-green eyes were so... She'd never dreamed a man would look at her like that. But she had a list, a mental list, of characteristics that disqualified her for the position of Duchess of Sconce. I make coarse jokes. That is, my sense of humour is not very ducal. His eyes laughed, even though his face was composed. I know only one such poem, which my cousin Peregrine taught me when we were boys. There once was a lady from Bude who went swimming one day in the lake. He paused, waited. An invitation. Olivia could feel herself turning pink. A man in a punt, she said softly, stuck his pole in the water. He picked up the verse and said, You can't swim here. It's private. The truth is that I never really understood it. Am I right in thinking that the lady is from Bude because she's swimming in the nude rather than a lake? Yes. I do understand the pole, but once you have to explain it, the verse is not very funny. Are you certain that you want to be with someone who not only can divest every bawdy pun of its humour, but must, in order to see the point? Are you certain you want to be with someone who doesn't share your love of science? I'm afraid. What, dear heart? You'll be bored with me, she said it in a rush. I can't talk about the quality of light, and if you tell me about mathematical functions, I truly will fall asleep. I have a very trivial mind. You understand emotion. I don't. That doesn't mean that my mind is worthless. We like different sorts of things. Why should I bore you with talking about mathematics? You can teach me to laugh instead. Something like a sob rose up in her throat. Will you teach our children bawdy verses as nursery rhymes? he asked. She considered. Perhaps. Then you will have to teach me some first. I'm sorry to say that Alfie never learned a single verse of poetry. His hands curved around her shoulders, slid up into her hair, teasing strands apart with his fingers. Do you know that I find myself wanting to talk about Alfie for the first time since he died? I've said his name aloud to you, and I don't feel as if I were falling into a black pit. She swallowed hard. Perhaps, he said delicately, we might bestow one of our children with the miserable door-knocker of a name, Alfington, just so that he's remembered. Oh, Quinn, she whispered. Then, because his question didn't need answering, since he knew the answer as well as she, just how many children do you think we will have? Many. His eyes were steady on hers. I always wanted the nursery to be full of children, so many that no one could be lonely. Olivia's heart ached for two lonely little dukes to be, Quinn and Alfie. Is that why you flew kites, so that Alfie wouldn't be lonely? Evangeline refused to have any more children. She was horrified by the way that her body changed, even more so because I loved how she looked. You did. I thought she had never looked more beautiful. She thought she had never looked more repulsive. She wouldn't let me touch her, or even see her unclothed, for two years. Olivia blinked. So she wasn't unfaithful the entire time you were married? She was. He said it calmly, as if he were discussing the weather. She felt differently about me than she did about her lovers. Olivia thought not for the first time, that there was no point in expressing aloud what she thought about Evangeline. I don't want to talk about my former wife, Quinn said. In fact, I'd just as soon never speak her name again. Are you sure? I'm so ordinary compared to you, Quinn. The look of complete perplexity in his eyes could not be feigned. 
What the hell do you mean? You're beautiful and funny, and everyone in this house loves you. With, he added punctiliously, the possible exception of my mother. But she will learn to care about you. A sob came, bringing a tear or two along with it. No, Quinn said, pulling her into his arms. No tears. He started kissing them away, brushing her face over and over with his lips in the softest of caresses. Olivia nestled into his arms. Do you mind telling me what exactly brought you into this room? Quinn whispered between kisses. When I saw you an hour ago, you were ready to sacrifice me for your honor. Olivia laughed shakily. I do feel terrible about Rupert, but Georgie says that we will find him the right wife, someone understanding, strong and kind. Ah, so your sister saw the truth. She told me there was no spark between you. Just as I told you. There was a deep satisfaction in his voice. You know, your sister would make an extremely capable scientist. She is an extremely capable scientist, and she will be a brilliant one once we buy her all the books she wants. Father never would, you know. He thought that books were unladylike, and Mother agreed. Quinn snorted. She burrowed closer, reveling in the strong arms around her, the dark, spicy, masculine smell of his chest, the steel of his body— the hard nudge against her stomach that told her without words that he wanted her, that he thought every inch of her breasts and stomach and hips was worth kissing. I do feel some remorse about stealing you from Mont, Surrey. Stealing a man's fiancée while he is serving his country is not entirely honourable. Olivia leaned against him, letting his heat warm her whole body. Rupert lost air at birth, she offered. He will never be all that he could be. He's more than enough, Quinn said simply. He's serving his country, risking his life to protect England. A few more tears dropped onto Quinn's coat. You're right. We will always be friends to him. It was a vow of sorts. He had you, and now I'm taking you away, and I will never forget what I forced him to give up. Olivia sniffled ungracefully, took the handkerchief he gave her. Rupert might be more resentful if you took Lucy. Quinn laughed. I mean it, she protested, and Georgie agrees. He nudged her head up, kissed her wet eyes again. Then his mouth came down on hers, and his hands were everywhere, possessive, almost rough, claiming and branding her. Olivia melted against him as if she had always belonged there. Quinn's kiss was sweet, but under it was a hard demand, a man's onslaught. Her arms curled around his neck, and she clung to him, opening her mouth, inviting him in. Her head reeled from the smoky male smell of him, the way he tasted like champagne, and something else, something intrinsically Quinn. The kiss made her feel wild and deeply alive. He had his hand on her cheek, tilting her head back, kissing her fiercely. This was intimacy, she realized suddenly. Quinn nipped her lower lip, and Olivia shivered against him, as if she'd been struck by a cold wind. He gave a little growl in response and tilted her head even further back. Then his mouth slid from hers to the curve of her jaw, leaving her to move restlessly against him. His arms ran more slowly down her back, pulling her closer. Olivia actually went up on her toes, so intent on the intoxicating warmth of his arms and his lips that she almost didn't hear the door opening. Chapter 19 Much Spontaneous Kissing and the Other Kind, Too Olivia broke free with a gasp and turned, still in the circle of Quinn's arms. The dowager didn't look particularly angry or judgmental. Instead, she was regarding them rather the way a small child might watch a caterpillar, with curiosity, 
but not revulsion. Tarquin, she stated. Mother, Quinn replied, not moving his arms from around Olivia. What on earth are you doing? Kissing Olivia, Quinn said, spontaneously. The Duchess's brow might have furrowed, except one had to assume that she did not hold with extravagant facial expressions of that sort. Miss Lytton, I might ask the same of you. Olivia thought about saying, Being kissed? and decided that dissembling would be the more prudent course. I expect that the exhaustion of the night has provoked a level of unwanted hilarity, she said, piling on words in the hope that the dowager would find herself confused. What was she thinking? This woman wrote the mirror of compliments. She was perfectly at home in a maze of language. It does not look like an expression of hilarity to me, the dowager remarked. Tarquin, I could remind you of the disastrous role that spontaneity played in your first marriage, but I shall not. Quite right, Quinn said, his arms tightening around Olivia. I have no need to do so, his mother continued, because this young woman is promised elsewhere, and kisses, whether spontaneous, hilarious, or otherwise, will have no consequence, given that fact. Miss Lytton, before you indulged in this fit of unwanted enjoyment, did you remind my son that you are soon to be a duchess? Olivia had the sudden feeling that the dowager was a vulture, circling far above, which probably made her a wounded lion, or something even more vulnerable, a rabbit thrown aside by the wheels of a carriage. Yes, she said. Then she looked at Quinn. As I informed you, Your Grace— I am indeed promised elsewhere. To the Marquis of Montsurry, Quinn said. Once Montsurry returns to England, you will be promised and speedily married to me. He turned to his mother. Olivia shall be Duchess of Sconce. I do not agree. There was a long moment of charged silence. Perhaps I should leave you to discuss this by yourselves, Olivia said gently freeing herself from Quinn's embrace. The dowager ignored her entirely, keeping her eyes fixed on her son. Miss Lytton is more than suitable for a dim-witted simpleton like Montsory. Moreover, she has shown a laudable loyalty toward the poor fellow, and I wrote his father myself to say so. However, she is not suitable for you. I think she is, Quinn stated. Olivia slid to the side. The Duchess turned to her. I trust you are not going to sidle from the room like a guilty housemaid with a broken saucer. Olivia's back snapped straight. I thought it would be more polite to allow you to continue this conversation with your son in private. I would agree, except that what I have to say pertains to you and to your sister. She is suitable to become Duchess of Sconce which is, by the way, a far older and more august title than that of Cantwick. You are not suitable for the position. Faced with the Duchess's direct gaze, Olivia realized that she could either drop her eyes and never regain a position of strength again, or fight back. My sister would indeed be a remarkable Duchess of Sconce, she said, hoping to avoid open warfare. That fact is irrelevant, Quinn said. Olivia didn't have to turn to see that he was smiling. She could hear it in his voice. I intend to marry Olivia, not Georgiana. For love, no doubt, the Duchess said in a burst of fury. And what has love gotten you, Tarquin, but a reputation for horns that hasn't left you even these many years later? She turned to Olivia. Do you know that he didn't speak for an entire year after his feckless wife drowned? Didn't speak. I spoke, Quinn protested. Oh, you may have asked for a slice of roast beef, but you didn't say anything worth hearing. Not for an entire year did you show interest in living. It was rather like sleepwalking, he agreed. Somewhat to Olivia's astonishment, he didn't sound in the least bit angry. Montsurry is a noodle, the dowager stated. Olivia stiffened. That is a fact, 
the dowager snapped before Olivia could say anything. He is a fine match for you, but the same is not true for my son. You are, Miss Lytton, if you'll excuse my bluntness. Overly fleshly, coarse, and rather ill-bred. The last is particularly surprising, given that your twin sister has achieved the utmost level of refinement. More to the point, you are uninteresting. You demonstrate no ability to concern yourselves in matters important to my son. Olivia pulled her dumpy self very straight and as tall as possible, and said with icy precision, I will respond only to the claim that reflects on my parents, although I will note that your incivility warrants no response at all. My parents may not be members of the aristocracy themselves, Your Grace, but they are related to peers on both sides. In fact, my father's claim to the title Esquire has been held for one generation longer than the sconces can claim. And, may I add, that when it comes to matters of breeding, no one in my family has married into the bum trinkets. The dowager's bosom rose slightly into the air, resembling a balloon ascension Olivia had once seen in Hyde Park. I was referring not to your birth, she said, biting the words with frigid disdain, but to your manners. I like the way Olivia looks, Quinn said, intervening. For the first time, his voice had a distinct warning in it. In fact, I adore the way she looks, and I think her manner is perfect for a duchess. I'm sure you do, the dowager snapped. There were red flags high in her cheeks, and her black eyes glinted with anger. What do you mean by that? Olivia demanded. I mean that you are made of the same stuff as his first Duchess Evangeline. He adored her appearance as well, and found out too late that all that wanton sensuality tends to mask a woman who should be flattered to be called a trollop. Mother, Quinn's voice was now as icy as his mother's. You go too far. I beg you, for the sake of all of us, to modify your voice and behavior. I will not. The Duchess was clearly beside herself. The Duke of Cantwick wrote me before you arrived, she said, turning on Olivia with the look of a mother tiger facing a threat to her cub. Olivia waited, head high. Have you informed my son that you may well be carrying the heir to the Cantwick title? You will note that I say nothing here about the fact that you are unmarried. That the Duke is reportedly such an innocent that you almost certainly molested the poor man, nor that he is barely eighteen. Those are such deeply unpleasant facts that one can only hope that no one outside your immediate family ever learns them, Miss Lytton, because they do not speak highly of you. Are you threatening me? Olivia gasped. The dowager actually backed up a step, but then linked her hands at her waist and stood her ground. Certainly not. Those of us in the peerage have no need to resort to methods such as you clearly envision. Quinn met Olivia's eyes with a silent question. No air, she managed. Mother, Quinn's voice was lethal and cold as ice. You will show me the courtesy to instruct your servants that you will be leaving for the dower house on the morning. I refer not to the dower house on these grounds, but that attached to Kilmarkey, our Scottish estate. To Olivia's surprise, it was she, and not the dowager, who blurted out, No! in response to this command. The dowager was utterly silent for a heartbeat. Then she bowed her head and descended into a curtsy. Olivia grabbed Quinn's arm and shook it. You will not do this, she said to him, not gently. He frowned at her. I don't. Your mother and I have the perfect right to disagree about what is best for you without your interfering. I wasn't interfering. I was responding to what my mother said about you. That I cannot and will not tolerate from anyone. He looked at his mother and said it again through clenched teeth. Anyone. You should know that any man, whether in my family or not, who implies that Olivia and Evangeline have anything in common, will give me satisfaction at the end of a sword. Oh, for goodness sake, 
Olivia said, grabbing hold of his cravat, since shaking his arm had had no effect. Could you just send the ducal mountain for one moment and pay attention? Your mother is worried sick about you, and you're threatening to send her off to Scotland. You weren't joking when you said that you don't always understand emotions, were you? The dowager made a small noise, but Olivia didn't look at her. She kept her eyes fastened on Quinn. He frowned at her. Of course your mother thinks that I resemble Evangeline. Well, in everything except our figures. I came here betrothed to one duke, and when everyone expected that you would betroth yourself to my sister, I stole you for myself. Your mother walked into a room and found the two of us unchaperoned, and lucky not to be sprawled together on the floor. I do look like the worst sort of hussy. If you are planning to duel every man who points that out, we shall have a very short marriage. Quinn's frown deepened. No time for all those children you envision, she continued remorselessly. No time to do anything but run around the country attacking people who are saying the obvious. Make no mistake, they won't just be saying it. Ten to one, they'll be making horns behind your back as well, at least for a few years. Some sort of rationality was stealing into his eyes. Don't you see? she said, letting go of his cravat. None of that matters. Your mother loves you. She wants to spare you the horns and the whispers, and the fat wife, too. She looked at the dowager. That's the only part that I'm having trouble forgiving you for. Quinn reached out, spun her back to him, and pulled her into his arms, held her tight, so tight that she could hardly breathe. I need you, he said, low and fierce, into her hair. Oh, God, Olivia, how did I ever live without you? She reached up, pulled his face down to hers. I'm yours, for good or ill. There was a little click as the door to the ballroom closed, but Olivia paid it no mind. You're the missing piece of me, Quinn said. You make me feel. You have always felt. You're one of the most sensitive, loving men I know. Anyone can tell that. He shook his head, so she just pulled his face to hers and gave him a kiss so searing that it said what neither of them were able to put in words, yet. Without a word, Quinn dropped into an armchair, taking Olivia with him. This time there was no stopping, and she knew it, he knew it. They kissed until little moans were coming again and again from her throat, and she was trembling, touching him everywhere she could reach, fingers shaking. Quinn pulled gently on her bodice, and her breast tumbled into his hand. For a moment he froze. Then, You're the most beautiful woman I've ever imagined, Olivia. May I? She wasn't entirely sure what he meant to do, but she nodded. She would always say yes to him, though it wouldn't be wise to let him know. His mouth was hot and wet on the curve of her breast. She arched her back offered herself until those searching lips reached her nipple. Olivia wasn't quite sure what happened next. She would have thought the most she would do was gasp at the surprise, perhaps utter a ladylike squeak, even a tiny shriek. No, with an entire ballroom full of aristocrats on the other side of the door, she let out a full-throated cry, an expression of need and burning want. Without pausing, Quinn clamped a hand over her mouth and then suckled harder. Olivia bit his finger, felt giddy spirals building in her body, sending her heartbeat into her throat. He raised his head, dropped his hand from her mouth, and rubbed a rough thumb across her nipple. Olivia arched back on his arm, mad with the need of it, dazed by the wild sensations coursing through her. We can't do this here, Quinn said his voice a growl against her throat. No, she jolted, shocked by her own voice, by the pleading hunger. Of course we can't, she sat up, preparing to stand. Quinn looked at her, a wicked invitation in his eyes, and rubbed a thumb over her nipple again. Her spine crumbled against him again, her legs falling open in an invitation he didn't take. His hand stilled finally. Olivia swallowed hard, fighting the impulse to beg for more. 
Are you quite certain that you are not carrying Montserrat's child? His voice held no condemnation, merely a request for information. She turned her head against his chest. Yes. But you and he. Olivia tried to think how to explain, while honouring her promise to Rupert. Georgiana was her twin, her other self. Rupert would understand that she had told Georgie the truth. But Quinn... Quinn was the man who was going to take her away from Rupert, and even if Rupert didn't actually want her, he was nevertheless accustomed to her. For a man who loved familiarity, it would be a wrench to lose her. There was no question but that Rupert wouldn't want Quinn to know about the limp celery. His father was concerned because Rupert was going off to war, she said, choosing her words carefully. Silence. Then... Canterwick forced you to sleep with his simpleton of a son out of wedlock because he was worried that he would have no heir. It sounded terrible, put like that. I wasn't forced. Did you volunteer? No. That's rape, he said flatly. No, Rupert wasn't. Rupert would never. Then it was double rape of the both of you. Olivia let out a huff of air. You make it sound despicable. I'm very fond of Rupert, as is he of me. We got through it as best we could, and he did tell me a poem he'd written. It was very good. What was it? It was about the death of a sparrow that had fallen from a tree. Quick, bright, a bird falls down to us. Darkness piles up in the trees. Quinn scowled. I don't understand that any better than the limerick Peregrine taught me. What does he mean by saying that darkness piles up in the trees? As someone who is studying light, I can tell you that rays don't pile up anywhere. Olivia tugged her bodice into place and then leaned back against his arm so she could see his face. Rupert's poem and the limerick aren't supposed to be dissected. They just cause a little rush of feeling, that's all. Darkness piles up is a feeling. Quinn sounded adorably confused. He's talking about grief. The grief he felt when the sparrow fell out of the tree. The bird was quick and bright, and then it was gone. Darkness piled up in the tree where the sparrow once sang. His eyes changed. Yes, like Alfie, she said, and put her cheek against his chest. The emotion on his face was so raw that it was painful to witness. They sat there for a while, Quinn's arms tight around her. Strains of a contra dance crept into the silence, drifting from the ballroom under the door. The music was joyous and sweet, as if it came from miles away, from a world in which no little boys or sparrows fell from trees. Finally, Quinn cleared his throat. You do realize that Montsurry. Rupert, she corrected him. Rupert hates to be called by his title. Were he able, he would be on intimate terms with the world. You realize that Rupert is more and more dislikable. He wrote the only piece of poetry I've ever understood. He's defending our country while I sleep comfortably at home, and I'm stealing his fiancée. Rupert would adore the idea that you were in the least bit jealous, Olivia said. He may not think clearly, but he understands feelings, and it hurts him when people are dismissive. He certainly understands feelings. I think the damage in his brain freed him. He cries whenever he is moved, whenever he hears or sees something grievous. Quinn digested this in silence. At last he rose setting her on her feet. Are you certain that you wish to marry me? I didn't have a rush of feeling in response to that poem until you explained it. Why couldn't it be in full sentences? Rupert very rarely speaks in full sentences. But he could have been more clear. Why didn't he say, when the swift flying sparrow died, likely of old age, and fell from the tree, I felt as if my heart grew very dark? Olivia wrapped her arms around him. You forgot bright, but I think you did well with dark. Bright doesn't make sense. 
birds from the Passeridae family tend to be grey or brown. I realise that my version is much longer, but it's more precise and grammatical. But your version talks about Rupert's feelings, whereas Rupert spoke to you about your feelings for Alfie. Ah, he considered, and then... I still find the conjoining of the specific words he chose to be quite illogical. Consider it the poetic equivalent of a mathematical function, Olivia suggested. So, do you suppose we should walk into the ballroom and pretend nothing has happened? You'll need to tie your hair back. No. No to going into the ballroom, or no to pretending that nothing happened? I have no objection to going into the ballroom because that's the only way to reach the stairs to the bedchambers. I have changed my mind. Olivia gave a little gasp. Are you saying... No! That would create a terrible scandal. Absolutely not. His hands tightened on her. A sparrow falls every second, Olivia. He gave her a kiss that was an erotic demand. It took a moment, but Olivia managed to pull herself away from his kiss and out of his arms. Your mother would be horrified by such a scandal. You remain here for at least a half hour. I'll try to slip into the ballroom, and hopefully people will think that I was merely composing myself after having a conversation with your mother. There is a footman in front of the door. What? My mother stationed him there after she left, to ensure our privacy. Look at the bottom of the door, and you'll see the shadow of his boots— my mother's servants are trained to have their shoulders to the wall. If you open the door, you'll strike him in the back, which will attract attention. Olivia bit her lip. I had not planned to embark upon a life as an infamous woman with such speed. He walked to the back of the room, wrenched open the window, and beckoned to her. It's a good thing you're a nimble climber. Why? This is practically ground level. Quinn swung a leg over the sill and dropped the foot or so to the ground. Then he held out his arms, grinning up at her, his eyes frankly lustful. I just realized that there is no way to reach the bedchambers without going through the kitchen. Olivia pulled up her skirts as demurely as possible and managed to get a leg over the window sill. It was harder than it looked, and she ended up toppling into Quinn's arms in a flutter of petticoats. So, he said, holding her very tightly as he placed her feet on the ground. We are not going back into the house. I think we'll go climbing instead. Climbing? Climbing where? Olivia looked around. They were on the side of the house, around the corner from the ballroom. Except where yellow light spilled from the windows, the gardens were silver, cool with the light of a full moon. Are you talking about a ladder reaching to your bedchamber? because I absolutely refuse to climb a ladder. I am not a hapless fool, eloping in the moonlight. Didn't you tell me that I could only look at you like that, if we were high in a tree? I don't want to climb any more trees, Quinn. What if you fall again? You're lucky not to have been killed. Quinn just grinned. Even at my advanced age, I can climb this tree. He reached out a hand. But Olivia hung back. It's chilly out here. I don't know what you have in mind, but I'm sure it's not proper. It's not proper at all, and don't worry about the cold. I'll grab a horse blanket or two from the stables. You want to stay outside? Olivia was about to voice a whole string of objections, but Quinn chose to counter her arguments by kissing her. The kiss was so successful that she found herself perched on that windowsill again, which put her breasts at a level that Quinn obviously appreciated. It's a good thing that door is closed, Quinn said some time later, his voice rough with need. Olivia gulped and came to her senses. Her hairpins were long gone and her hair was around her shoulders. What's more, her bodice had fallen almost to her waist. Skin, far too much skin gleamed in the moonlight. Oh, oh, she cried, yanking at her gown. Oh, no. Yes, yes, Quinn said, his hands catching hers, holding them wide so that he could admire her breasts. I will never have enough of you, Olivia. You're like a drug. He dropped her hands and bent his head again. 
Olivia stilled, hand on the black hair that fell like silk onto her breast as he kissed her. Open, wet-mouthed kisses that sent stinging needles, a sweet kind of torment, down her legs. I'm not cold any longer, she whispered, taking her courage in her hands. This was the right thing to do. She was choosing her own duke. Where is your tree? She followed him, but in reality she followed the solemn laughter, and it was laughter, that bloomed in his eyes when she yanked her bodice up, the sweet heat of his mouth, the raw sound of his voice breathing her name. She would follow him anywhere. Chapter 20 The Lucky Lady from Peedle the tree turned out to be behind the stables, and it wasn't just a tree. It was a house in a tree. Olivia stood at the base, looking up with stupefaction. What on earth is it? A tree house. Alfie's tree house. Alfie had a tree house. That was a stupid question. After all, there it was, a tiny house, perched in a tree. It even had windows and a door. Alfie liked to ask questions, Quinn said, still holding her hand. He had questions about everything. What was holding up the moon? Why apples turn brown? And who made up the alphabet? One day, he wanted to know why we live on the ground rather than in trees. Olivia leaned over, brushed a kiss on his mouth. He was your little sparrow. Yes. But his voice wasn't heavy with grief. In fact... It was joyous. I had the treehouse built for Alfie because I thought it was a particularly good question and merited experimentation. We lived there for two days. And what did Alfie decide? That the Dukes of Sconce live on the ground because it's very difficult for footmen to climb the steps up the trunk with a supper tray. And Cleese couldn't come at all. Alfie pointed out that Cleese is never happy unless he knows what everyone is doing— so it wasn't very kind to him if the two of us decided to live in a tree forever. Olivia laughed aloud, reasoning that befits a future duke. Wait, did I hear someone laughing beside myself? Quinn pulled her against his hard body. If you climb into that tree house with me, Olivia, there is no going back. I will never allow you to marry Rupert. And make no mistake, I allowed Evangeline to wander where she would, but I feel differently about you. If you even make eyes at a man, I'll probably kill him. Olivia reached up on tiptoe, nipped at his chin. That goes both ways. If I catch you ogling someone else's breasts the way you do mine, I won't kill her. I'll go straight for you. Consider yourself warned. Quinn laughed. That's twice in one minute. Olivia teased. At this rate, you'll horrify my mother by turning into a belly laugher. I was faithful to Evangeline, he said, ignoring her fanning. And I feel twice for you what I felt for her. I suspect I'm not capable of being unfaithful to you. Olivia's smile wavered, and she felt a lump in her throat. She took a deep breath and turned toward the tree trunk. How does one get up there? There are steps nailed to the trunk. Wait one moment. He ducked into the stables, reappearing with two blankets flung over his shoulder. Olivia was in the house a moment later. The tree house had windows on all four sides, open to the moonlight, which poured in like fairy dust, turned liquid silver. It was just tall enough for Olivia to stand up in. Quinn had to bend his head. The floor was covered with matting, onto which Quinn threw the blankets. Olivia hesitated. It was all very well for Quinn to talk about how much he loved her breasts, but there was no way to block these windows. She had thought they would make love in a bedchamber, in the dark. Quinn sat down, held out his hand. She gave him a weak smile. Second thoughts not allowed, he said cheerfully. He reached forward, grabbed her hand, and pulled her into his lap. It's just that there are no curtains. I know, and sound travels. You needn't sound so gleeful. 
I think I prefer the old Quinn who never smiled. Too late. He nipped her ear, soothed the sting with a warm tongue. I sent all the stable hands around to the kitchens except for two old men who are too deaf to hear you. Hear me? The comment was not welcome. It made her seem as if she had no self-control. In a swift roll, Quinn toppled backward and positioned himself on top of her, settling between her legs. They fit together perfectly. Olivia felt as if her skin suddenly woke up. Perhaps she did have no self-control. He propped himself on his elbows, staring down at her for a long moment. Till death us do part. The faintest shadow of heartbreaking anxiety was detectable in his eyes. Olivia swallowed a silent curse for his late wife, and nodded. In sickness and in health. When the Duke of Sconce put his mind to something mechanical, its intricacies were generally fathomed instantly, and Olivia's clothing was no exception. Faster than she would have believed possible, he divested her of slippers, gown, corset. Kneeling at her side, his eyes fiery with desire, he reached for her chemise. No! Olivia cried, grabbing his hand. As it was, her chemise was traitorously delicate. Why had she chosen to wear something that was as transparent as a window pane? She cast one look down at her body and found her chemise caught beneath her hips so that it strained against her belly. Why had she eaten all those meat pies? Couldn't she have pictured a moment like this one? She went rigid with mortification and regret. If only she were Georgiana, someone with enough control that she wouldn't have eaten so much. It would be so much better for both of them if she had Georgie's slender thighs. If she had her sister's legs, she would flaunt them, roll on her hip, and know that his eyes couldn't leave her. She swallowed. I will not do this unless I can keep my chemise on. I mean that. The words were as resolute as she could make them, bitten off and stern. Quinn's brows drew together for a second, but he nodded. He looked like some sort of hawk, tamed to the hand, but still wild. His skin glowed like honey in the moonlight. She sat up, pulling her chemise away from her skin so that it wasn't quite so revealing. What did a lady do in this situation? Dimly, in a small corner of her mind, Olivia realized that her mother's Dutchification program had neglected this entire subject— it hardly needed be added that the mirror of compliments was focused on preserving chastity rather than abandoning it. I'm not sure what to do next, she admitted, hoping he wouldn't ask for any details about her supposed experiences with Rupert. The look in his eyes was pure, arrogant male delight. Luckily, I do. She waited. Take off my coat, he whispered so softly she could barely hear him. A smile trembled on her lips, and she reached out and pushed the coat off his shoulders. Then she unbuttoned his waistcoat, tossed it to the side, and tugged his shirt free from his breeches. She moved to pull up the shirt, but was diverted by the skin she found at his waist. She came up on her knees, too, and ran her hands around his tight abdomen to the swelling muscles of his back. How is it you are so fit? Most men are rather soft, I have found. He shrugged. Physical exercise clearly has a positive effect on the human physiology. There seemed sufficient evidence to engage in it on a regular basis. His skin was smooth and hot under her fingers. She let her hands wander under his shirt, up his broad back to his shoulders, back down again, up his front. Apart from some small shivers, he let her do as she wished. When she brushed her fingers over his nipples, a hoarse grunt broke from his lips. She glanced and saw that his eyes were shut. Keep your eyes closed, she ordered, feeling a flash of courage. If his eyes remained closed the entire time, it would be as good as having curtains in a decently dark bedchamber. He nodded obediently. She felt more confident when he wasn't looking at her. She needn't worry about how much that ridiculous chemise was revealing. She managed to pull his shirt over his head, discovering that his torso was beautiful, 
with a narrow, taut waist. She caressed every bit of his chest, and then, glancing again at his still closed eyes, leaned in close and placed her mouth where her hands had been. A low noise broke from his lips. No opening your eyes, she warned. His lips tightened, but he nodded. She bent to him again, kissing him, tasting him, dusting little kisses over his entire chest, and she kept coming back to his nipples, because every time she rubbed her lips across them, he responded. It was like champagne, that little sound he made. It was power, and she was drunk on it. She forgot to keep an eye on his face, reassuring herself that he wasn't watching. Instead, she came closer, squirming onto his lap so that she could rub more than her lips against him. Olivia. His voice was soft, liquid with passion. Startled, she looked up to find those grey-green eyes gazing at her. The moonlight frosted his thick lashes, and he looked otherworldly, a fairy king, not a mere mortal. You were to keep your eyes closed, she said, giving in to temptation and running a fingertip along his lashes. You're so beautiful, Quinn, too beautiful for me. He laughed at that, a third laugh in the space of an hour. She trailed her finger down across his full bottom lip, leaned forward and carefully followed that line with her tongue. May I touch you now? He murmured against her lips. <clears throat> she whispered back, loving the taste of him. Big hands came to her back and pulled her against his naked chest. Olivia gasped as her breasts were pressed against him. They felt plump and wildly sensitive. One hand held her against him, while another slid down her back, slow and sensuous. Aren't you going to remove the rest of my clothing? He said it low and soft, like a dare he knew she couldn't resist. She almost tumbled off his lap, turned to face him. My breeches have a placket, he said, making no move to undo it himself. Olivia leaned a little closer and found what he meant. She fumbled, her fingers trying to manipulate the buttons, aware that his breathing was fast and ragged. Once she saw how he trembled at her touch, she slowed down, caressing just inside the band of his breeches, loving his swift intake of breath as her fingers dipped lower. Slowly, slowly, she eased the breeches over his lean hips, down powerful thighs. Once they were at his knees, he swiftly removed them and tossed them to the side. Now he wore nothing but smalls, which did very little to conceal what lay underneath. No limp salary this. Though Olivia instantly pushed away the thought as disloyal to Rupert. She may not be marrying him, but she would always be his true friend. She was slow and careful, working Quinn free from his smalls, trying not to show awe at the size of him. He threw the smalls after the breeches and came back to her, kneeling, hands quiet at his sides, but she could sense the leashed power in him, waiting to spring free, to spring on her. A wave of anxiety flooded her again, sent her eyes skittering from him, from all that perfection, down to her thighs, only to find that blasted chemise had caught again and was emphasizing the fleshiness of her upper leg. Heat rushed into her cheeks as she plucked it free. He said not a word. She looked up to see that he was regarding her with such a tender expression that she cringed. Don't you dare pity me, she snapped. Surprise flooded his eyes. What do you mean? Nothing, Olivia said. I'm sorry. I misunderstood. Well, to her dismay, she felt as if tears were threatening, added quickly, What do we do now? His face was serious again, the expression he had when he was thinking about light or poetry. It's just that I'm not sure what to do, she said, her voice catching. Tears pushed at her eyes again. Dear heart, he said, what's the matter? He reached out and put his arms around her. 
Nothing, she muttered, feeling ten times a fool. Kiss me? Good idea. He kissed her slowly and sweetly, eyes closed. She checked before she relaxed into the feeling of being near Quinn. Then, when she was kissed into a hazy state, he moved so that she found herself on her back, her hair flowing around her. It was almost too much, trying to take in the sensation of his body heavy against her side, naked, his arousal urgent against her, and the moon was pitiless, casting its cool silver light everywhere. It was pretty, she had to admit that. The inside of the little house glimmered with light that looked magical. If only it weren't so revealing. A little less magic. That was all she asked. There's something wrong, Quinn said, raising himself on all fours and looking down at her. Her lip quivered, and then, no longer able to choke them back, a tear spilled, even as she told herself, Don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. Quinn reached out with a thumb, gently rubbed it away. Help me, sweetheart. Emotions are not my strong point. I need you to tell me what's the matter. She shook her head. Nothing. I'm simply being foolish. His eyes searched hers, and Olivia looked away, fast. He saw too much with those damnably intelligent eyes of his. The next thing she knew, her hands were caught and held above her head. If you won't tell, I'll have to resort to logic. You're not afraid of being with me, and you told me that you're not a virgin, so you can't be afraid of pain. Did she actually say that? He had inferred that she and Rupert had made love, and she couldn't tell him otherwise without breaking her promise. Unless... He hesitated. Am I considerably larger than Rupert? Her gaze lingered on him with pleasure, and he seemed to throb and grow under that gaze. Yes, she murmured, her voice throaty. He laughed. That is not fear that I hear in your voice. Does it bother you that I've... I've seen Rupert before you? He frowned. Why should it? You didn't choose to lose your virginity to Rupert, any more than he chose the reverse. I feel a measure of contempt for Rupert's father, but none for you. It was very like Quinn, both logical and fair. She managed a wobbly smile. All the same, she began. But he cut her off. That's not it, Olivia. Please don't lie to me. Her eyes fell. When I am in doubt, I make a list of questions, he said, leaning down and biting her earlobe so that she squealed. First question. Is darling Olivia afraid of my cock? He picked up her hand, curled it around his erection. Olivia gasped, delighted at its silky heat, smoothness, the way it jumped in her hand. She slid up, down, took a quick glimpse and realized that Quinn's eyes were shut, head thrown back, just the way she liked him. She tightened her grip, wondered what he might taste like. He moved her hand away, satisfied with her silent answer to his question. Not afraid of it, he murmured, his voice a shade deeper, darker than it had been. Second question. Is my Olivia afraid there might be pain? He looked at her intently. She shook her head. I didn't think so, he said with satisfaction. Besides, I mean to make you so limp with pleasure that you'll be begging me for more of the same. This time his smile was pure, unadulterated male. Olivia's heart skipped a beat. Third question, he said and he shifted onto his knees. Could it be that foolish, foolish Olivia fears that I won't like her body? And then, quick as a cat, while she was still considering her reply, for even though he was right, she certainly didn't want to admit it, he reached out and ripped her chemise straight down the middle. It was a good thing the staff had been sent away from the stables, 
because Olivia's scream of outrage could likely have been heard well into the gardens. But Quinn was already ripping away the last shred of cloth. Olivia squeezed her eyes, not wanting to see his face. That damn moonlight was everywhere, illuminating every curve and wobble. He didn't touch her, and he didn't say anything. Olivia felt as though time stood still, leaving her stranded in the most humiliating moment of her life. When at last he spoke, his voice was greedy and rough. You don't really wish that you were a scrawny thing like your sister, do you? Georgiana is not scrawny, Olivia said, her eyes popping open. Like a stick of celery, Quinn said, legs like a grasshopper's. A man wants this, Olivia. His hands came gently, shaping her breasts. I do know that, Olivia said, shivering as his touch sent flames licking over her body. I like my breasts. His hands slid lower, over the tummy that wasn't washboard tight, like his, or slender as a dancer's, like Georgiana's. A man wants this. His voice was still darker, rusty with passion, as his fingers bit into her curves, sank into her warmth. They slid lower, onto her hips. You do remember that I never lie he said, his eyes fixed on his hands. Olivia looked down too, curious, seeing honey-dark hands gripping her hips. She looked like cream in the moonlight, as if her skin were glowing with some sort of inner luminescence. Yes, I remember, she managed. I think I love your hips and your ass most of all. The emotion in his voice was unmistakable but then I remember your breasts, and how much I love them. I love every biteable, lush, delicious curve, Olivia, including those you haven't let me touch or kiss yet. Until this moment, Olivia had been holding her body rigid, her thighs tight, her stomach pulled in. Now, slowly, she relaxed, watching him. Quinn couldn't lie. She knew that. She had told Georgie that. She believed it. The lust on his face, the way he was touching her, almost reverently, bending his head now, kissing her greedily. That was the truth. Succulent, he murmured. You make me sound like a roast chicken. Ripe and plump and delicious. Soft. She shook her head. Those are not the words a woman wants to hear from a man looking at her thighs. But she was feeling better, and they both knew it. Georgie does not have grasshopper legs, she said, poking him to make sure that he'd heard her. What he was doing now was going to make her collapse in a boneless heap, but she had to make sure he understood that one thing. She has elegant, slender legs that any woman would love to have. He looked down at her, eyes predatory, those big hands holding her. Not my woman. Not you. Olivia was about to defend her sister again, but he pulled her legs open and put his mouth on her, on that part of her. She went rigid again for a second, long enough for a rough lap and a sweet lick a finger stroking where a tongue had just been. Uh. And then she forgot about Georgie, forgot her own name, forgot everything except the man who drove her further into a firestorm with every lick. She couldn't stop twisting or suppress the moans leaving her throat, one after another, undignified, guttural, animal. Quinn's hands were everywhere, touching her adoring her, sliding under her and biting into her bottom, then soothing the little pain, sliding around her thighs, making it clear that every silky inch met with his satisfaction, finally inching up, parting her folds, one finger going, there. Olivia stiffened again, a broken moan coming from her lips. You're so tight, Quinn muttered. That's it, Olivia. Now.
One last rough lick, one twist of that clever finger. The part of her that was Olivia, smart, wry, wordplay loving, was swallowed up by a wave of pleasure so acute that her body twisted, arched in a silent scream that matched the one coming from her lips. Quinn reared over her, caught her mouth in a wild kiss, pulled her into just the right position, and thrust. It was the tail end of that red-hot blindness, the utter rending of self, and for a moment Olivia didn't register the intrusion. And the next moment she did. It was huge, scalding hot, excruciating. Still, it was Quinn above her, head thrown back, eyes closed. You feel so. His voice was ragged, rough with passion. He couldn't finish the sentence. It was as instinctive as breathing. She rocked back, arched, took the last inches of him. Changed her mind and wished she hadn't. Desire was one thing, agonizing pain was another. His throat worked, and he let out a low noise, a growl of male possession and pleasure. If Olivia's mind had been fogged before, it was clear now. This hurt like, like, it helped to silently run over some curses that Georgiana would never utter aloud. He was not only huge, but he was burning her up. Who would have thought a body part could be so hot? Suddenly, his face changed and his eyes snapped open. There's something about you. Olivia tried, unsuccessfully, to look as if she were enjoying herself. You were a virgin. She didn't bother responding. She was wondering whether women ever fainted during the act. Quinn dropped his body down a few inches, bringing his face closer to hers. Olivia suppressed a moan. Movement, not a good idea. A few silent curses that Georgiana had never even heard, let alone said aloud, drifted through her mind. Talk to me, sweetheart. Quinn's voice cut through her body's violent protest. He shifted again. Stop that, she said grimly. No moving. He nodded. Do you remember that limerick about the lady who was good with her needle? Another nod. Why couldn't I fall in love with the man she learned her skills from? I don't want you to ever move again. Not backwards or forwards. You're too big. A gleam of laughter beat back the fierce hunger in his eyes. He dropped his head and gave her a lingering kiss. I'll happily stay here forever, he whispered. I think this is my favorite place in the world. They'll have to bury us in a large coffin, Olivia said, joking, because if she didn't, she might think too much about what a tragedy this was. They didn't fit together. He was simply too large. This will not work, she said, when Quinn didn't respond to her sally about the coffin. He was kissing her cheek and her ear. All very nice, but as every nerve in her body was concentrating on the waves of pain sweeping from between her legs, she would be happy to dispense with the kisses. Actually, I take it back about not moving. I think it's probably time for you to move away, she said, trying to be nice about it. He made a little murmur and started kissing her eyebrows. Annoying, very annoying. Out, she said, giving him a little push. I can't. Someone told me not to move. This is not the time to develop a sense of humor. He rubbed noses with her. Such a startling, tender movement that she fell silent. I wouldn't have thrust like that if I'd known you were a virgin and I was under the impression that you informed me of your experience. You inferred such, Olivia told him. It wasn't my... I couldn't clarify. But you left the Duke thinking his son's heir might be on the way. Laughter shone in his eyes. It served him right, she said, giving Quinn a little bite on his chin, just because it was there, and he was beautiful. Now... I hate to sound as though I have an appointment, but I'm sure there's somewhere important I should be. Hurts, does it? He dropped a kiss on her lips. I cannot even describe how much. Because you're a lady? She nodded. 
If I had known you were a virgin, I would have pushed up your knees and then entered you gently and very slowly. It would have led to the same result. Olivia couldn't imagine that the mechanics could change, given the fixed sizes of their respective parts. But would you bend your knees, just to try? She bent her knees, grudgingly. Sometimes a woman wraps her legs around her lover's waist. She could just see herself doing that, like some sort of acrobat. Why hadn't she realized how unsuited she was for bedroom activities? She might not insist on the curtains being closed every single night, but lift her legs in such an undignified way. Absolutely not. Never, she added, just to make sure he understood. His eyes were laughing at her, but that was because he didn't understand just how much this all hurt. Olivia, he said, lowering his mouth on hers again, entirely relaxed, as if he meant to stay in the same position all night. I love you and then he kissed her, demanding that she open her mouth. So she did. He plunged inside, his tongue playing a wet, hot game with hers, and Olivia understood for the first time. This kind of kissing was carnal. It was outrageous. No wonder, she murmured. He pulled back a fraction of an inch, arched an eyebrow. No wonder they don't allow debutantes to kiss she explained. It's just another way to make love, isn't it? In answer, he took her mouth again, possessive, hot, sweet, all the sides of Quinn at once. Dear heart, he said a while later, after his hand had drifted to her breast, does it still hurt as much as it did? Of course, Olivia said automatically, even though she was enjoying his caresses. And how could she not? She was always aware of the pain, and the sense that something foreign and far too large was splitting her in half. But then she wriggled a trifle, and realized that it didn't hurt quite as much as it had before. It does feel a little better. I suppose you shrink when we don't do anything for a while. He blinked. Sweetheart. If you think a man who's found his way into the sweetest, tightest place in the world would shrink. She wriggled again, thought about that blissful feeling he gave her before all of this started. It wasn't fair to leave him without it. She wasn't afraid of pain. Or rather, she didn't believe in being afraid of pain. You should start again, she said. In truth, she was afraid but that didn't mean she hadn't courage. He looked unconvinced. Now, Olivia elaborated, you can move back and forth now. Slowly, he withdrew. Oddly enough, once he was gone, she felt empty. Ridiculous, really. Then he was there again, slow this time, very slow. Part of her just wanted him to go fast, get it over with, Another part was entranced by the slow invasion. It did something. She found her breath hitching and her back arching a little. Better, he asked quietly, but she could hear the gruffness in his voice. She nodded. Again. She acquiesced. He pushed in, slow and steady. It wasn't comfortable, not at all, but it was bearable. The rough sense of friction was even rather pleasant, for some strange reason. And there was a trace of anxiety in Quinn's eyes, pinching away some of his pleasure. I'm starting to love this, she said, giving him a big smile. I could do this all night. I'll probably... Liar, he growled, biting back the smile in his eyes. I know this is hell for you, but Olivia... It is heaven for me. I never imagined anything could feel the way you do. Braced on his forearms, he looked down at her, eyes heavy-lidded, slumberous with passion. Olivia let the gladness of it fill her heart. She arched her back, moved toward him. It was an awkward movement, but he understood. He threw his head back, eyes closed, and thrust forward fast and hard. Once, 
twice, again. Just when Olivia started to think that perhaps it wasn't quite so horrible, Quinn made a sound, a brutal, dangerous sound, and thrust into her a final time. If he had fallen on top of Georgiana like that, like a felled tree, he might have killed her. The good news was that because she had never taken to a lettuce diet, Quinn felt exactly right falling on top of her. In fact, Olivia tightened her arms around his neck to keep him in place. The terrible burning between her legs seemed to have lessened too. In fact, it felt rather tingly and almost comfortable down there. It was so intimate. He was part of her. They were connected, two people, put together like a jigsaw puzzle that couldn't be put asunder. The thought made her a little teary. Quinn, she said softly, turning her head, feathering kisses along his cheekbone. She wanted to share this ecstatic, perfect, most intimate moment. He was asleep. Olivia started laughing, and the giggles bubbling up her chest woke him. Sorry, love, he said, voice dark with sleep, and shifted to the side. No place to wash, he mumbled. His eyes closed again. He was out. Olivia tore a strip of her ruined chemise and cleaned herself up as well as she could. There wasn't very much blood, which was truly surprising. From the way she felt, blood should have gushed out of her. But no. She reached for the second blanket, pulled it over the naked body of her first lover, her only lover, curled up against his side and settled herself to sleep. Her body was throbbing and tingling in an unfamiliar way that made it hard to settle down, so she started thinking again about the blasted lady with her needle. That was a ridiculous description for something that was more like a battering ram. But there was something overwhelming, wonderful about the experience. It made her feel... Absurd, she told herself, curling tighter. No human can own another. Possessiveness? No. She must have misunderstood the look in Quinn's eyes. She wasn't even his wife yet. Still, she fell asleep thinking about the way he looked at her as he thrust. Ferocious. Hungry. Possessive. Mm. Chapter 21 the Definition of Marriage Quinn woke very early in the morning, as he often did, but he realized immediately that nothing else about this particular awakening felt familiar. Normally, he woke on a soft, pristine bed, arms curled around no one at all. But now he lay on a rough, hard surface, arms curled around a soft, sleeping woman. What's more, dawn light unfiltered by draperies, bathed his face, and it sounded as if some tipsy birds were singing into his ear. Suddenly the world, and recognition of just where he was, and with whom, flooded back into his head. It was Olivia whom he had clutched all night, as if afraid she would escape. Olivia, whose laughing eyes and silly sense of humour and wry intelligence surprised him and delighted him, and made him mad with lust. Olivia was his. Somehow he'd managed to find a woman who was the opposite of Evangeline. Evangeline had played the virgin, but in truth wasn't. Olivia had played an experienced woman, but in truth wasn't. For a moment or two he puzzled over what precisely had happened between her and the saintly Rupert, but then he let it go. She would never tell. She must have promised Montsari. If only he had known. He had thrust into her, believing that she was used to shaking the sheets with her fiancé, thinking she was a woman long pleasured. His former wife had trained him to it. To be blunt, making love to Evangeline had been like riding the public highway. Making love to Olivia was all different and not just because of physical differences. Every moan and shudder she gave seemed to ring changes in his own body. 
and through it all came a wild sense of possession. Olivia was his, all his. No other man had ever touched her the way he had. The ferocity of his possessiveness was astonishing, and not logical. He lay there for some time, listening to a thrush sing, and thinking about the kind of betrayal that makes a man desperate to find a woman who loves only him. Olivia's virginity was the most beautiful gift she could have given him. His arms tightened even thinking of it. He had caused her physical pain, and he felt terrible for it, but knowing that he was the very first. He shook the feeling away. It was illogical. It didn't matter how many men a woman had slept with. He had told himself that, after Evangeline, on their wedding night, had detailed her many exploits, which had begun with a footman at the tender age of fifteen. He had been right. None of those men had changed the essential Evangeline, or the way he'd felt about her. But still, that glow, that ferocious, animalistic, possessive glow at the bottom of his heart, didn't fade away. He dismissed it as being akin to poetry, unaccountable, illogical. Poor Olivia was undoubtedly sore after the events of the previous night. He eased her onto her back, then took his time caressing those creamy, soft, intoxicating curves. She slept on. He began embellishing his touch with a kiss now and then. She stirred a few times, but it wasn't until he had a hand exploring the delicate skin on her inner thigh while his mouth inched closer to a sweet, pink nipple. She woke up. She didn't murmur a greeting. Instead, she sat straight upright and shrieked, Oh my goodness! Where am I? Quinn wasn't very good at answering questions at the best of times, unless, of course, they had to do with mathematics. Instead of answering, he reached up, pulled that luscious bundle of female flesh down onto his chest, and kissed her, which made a feeling of possessiveness rage through his body again. He let it happen. It wasn't logical, wasn't really him. It was powerful, though. Oh, Quinn, Olivia whispered considerably later. She was flat on her back, and he was inching his way down her body, kissing as he went. Mm. I love it when you growl in my ear. Quinn thought about that. You make me sound like a rabid bulldog. She threw her hands over her head in a happy stretch that signaled pure pleasure. I don't mean you growl like a dog. You're... It's as though you're so happy to have me here. You're mine, he said matter-of-factly. Of course I'm happy you're here. He nudged her legs apart. Just what are you doing down there? Olivia asked, peering down at him. Kissing your thighs. She tried to pull her knees together. Absolutely not. We must return to the house before your guests notice our absence. Thank goodness these birds made such a racket and woke us up. He lapped a little design on her thigh that made her shiver despite all her busy conversation, slid his tongue a little closer to her hot middle, caressed her breast in a way that he now knew drove her half mad with pleasure. Why? Why? Quinn, she said, in that breathless voice he'd heard only a few times. What? He ran a delicate finger over her beautiful pink folds. She sat up again. No! And she followed that up with a lot of babble. They had to go inside, they had to bathe and dress, they had to avoid his mother, they had to... The one thing his beloved Olivia didn't realize about him yet was that when Quinn made up his mind... He got what he wanted. The only way to stop the flood of words and anxiety was to pull her into a kiss, since his hand had found its way to the softest, wettest place in her whole body. He wasn't inclined to listen to protests. Mind you, he wanted to do more than stroke her, but if he had momentarily lost self-control the night before, he had it again now. Olivia, sweet Olivia needed to experience bone-numbing pleasure before he would venture near her again. 
Finally, he had her gasping and twisting against his finger and pleading, Please, please, please. He ruthlessly rejected the urge to leap on top of her and instead carefully pushed another finger next to the first. And that was it. She cried out, clutching at his shoulders, her whole body shaking. It was so damned enticing that Quinn actually had to stop for a moment and wrestle his own body back into submission. She was everything he wanted, everything he could ever want. He couldn't ruin it. Quinn, she said, struggling for breath. Oh, that, that. He nodded, rolling over and giving his body another little lecture. No, he would not rub against her. Your turn, she said, looking like the brave little soldier facing a battalion of armed elephants. That did it. His erection finally calmed enough that he could sit up. Time to return to the house, he said, looking around for his smalls. It was the work of a moment to put on his breeches and shirt. We should go back before too many servants are up and about. My knees are weak, Olivia said. Her voice was throaty and sounded as though she was inviting precisely that which she was not. Up, he said. You go, she suggested. I'll take a little nap and follow later. She curled into a ball and tugged the blanket over herself again. Her eyes drifted shut. I can't leave you in a tree. Yes, you certainly can. You go inside and have breakfast with everyone. I'll come in later. That way, no one will think that we spent the night doing wicked things in a tree, which I'm sure is what would come to mind if we appeared together. I know I often assume people are cavorting in trees. I cannot leave you here, he said patiently. I'll be fine. You're the one who fell out of that other tree, not me. Quinn squatted down. Olivia, wake up. We're going inside, and I can't carry you down. Too tired and too sore. I'm not climbing down until I've had a rest. Wake me in a few hours. That was an order. Quinn stood up, as best he could, and looked down at his future duchess. She seemed to be sleeping peacefully, a hand under her cheek, her gorgeous, tousled hair curling all over the blanket. She didn't even have a pillow, and yet she looked blissfully comfortable. He found he was grinning. He was rumpled and unwashed, and happier than he'd been in years. She opened one eye. Bring some tea when you come back? As I explained, footmen can't negotiate up the ladder while carrying trays. Wait a minute. Are you Miss Lytton asking a duke to fetch you some tea? Her eye closed again, but he saw the little curl of a smile on her mouth. She was testing her power, his Olivia was. Yes, she said sweetly. That's what marriage is all about. What is it all about? Being nice, because, she smiled, you want the other person to be nice to you. He brought her tea and crumpets. Chapter 22 Wreathed in Glory Early Evening I simply cannot believe you did that! It was a little insulting the way Georgiana was staring at Olivia, rather as if she were a two-headed calf at the fair. No wonder you didn't come to breakfast, or lunch. I slept right through both, but it wasn't as if we spent the night in the open air, Olivia tried to explain. It's a tiny house. It just happens to be up in a tree. Georgiana snapped her mouth shut. Her eyes were laughing, though. I simply cannot believe it. No one could get me into a tree. I'm quite certain that you found the one man in the world who likes to climb trees. It's rather amazing, isn't it? Olivia said. She could hardly put it into words. He's everything I would have dreamed of. 
if I'd thought that I could dream. Georgiana shook her head. Even you couldn't have dreamed up a man who likes to sleep in trees. I know. Olivia was so happy that she felt as if she were about to burst. How was luncheon? We should join the party in the drawing room, Georgiana said, starting. Her grace is terribly irritable. She clearly suspects there's a reason you missed breakfast and luncheon. None of the house guests have departed, and I gather some plan to stay for at least a week. She was quite short with Mr. Epicure Dapper, the gentleman with the remarkable addiction to puffed shoulders on his coats. Olivia snorted. How the mighty have fallen! Lord Justin takes positive delight in tormenting her, you know. After luncheon, the young ladies all begged him to sing for them, and he sang French songs. He is half French, is he not? Olivia held open the bedchamber door so that Georgiana could precede her. Why shouldn't he sing in his native language? Oh, Olivia, you know perfectly well that French songs are nothing like English ones. They sound improper even when they aren't. Her irritability has nothing to do with Justin's propensity for singing in his mother's tongue. Georgiana stopped short at the top of the stairway. Don't tell me you crossed swords with her again last night. Aren't you glad you weren't with us? It would have given you a double migraine, if such a thing exists. Olivia started down, but Georgiana caught her arm. Tell me all, please. If you remember... You sent me into the library and said that Quinn would follow. Which he did. I watched him track you through the crowd like a fox stalking a chicken. We had just worked out a few things to both of our satisfaction when the dowager entered the room. She interrupted us, if you follow what I'm saying. Just what are you saying? Not that, Olivia said with a crow of laughter. We were merely kissing. Oh, dear. She was horribly cross about it. She said that I was too fat to marry her son, Olivia said, going straight to the only point that she clearly remembered. Apparently, she believes I was a sensible choice for Rupert because my ample hips make up for his deficient brains. I cannot believe the dowager said such a thing, Georgiana gasped. She can be brusque, perhaps, but never uncivil. And such a comment, which is so untrue, goes far beyond garden variety in civility. I assure you, she did say it, but she didn't truly mean it, Olivia said. She's merely cross that now she will not have wonderful you as her daughter-in-law. And really, who can blame her? You are very kind, Olivia, but I am disappointed, Georgiana said her small bosom swelling with such indignation that she bore a faint resemblance to the dowager herself. For such a lady of consequence to fall below her own firmly held standards is shocking. It's probably my influence. I expect she is nothing but sunshine and daisies in the general course of events. I bring out the predator in her. That's no predator you're describing. It's rude, common behaviour. Georgiana finally started down the stairs. Well, the dowager may be unhappy, but Mother will be ecstatic. I doubt that very much. One duke is as good as another. Once she realizes that you refuse to take my place. Well, I don't like to think. Remember, Father promised that one of his daughters would marry Rupert. Though really, Georgie, when I think on it, you could do worse. You are trained to the job. You don't want me to marry Rupert, Georgiana stated. And I don't want to marry Rupert. And frankly, whereas you were always a good daughter, except in the smallest things, I'm not. You're not? Olivia asked. Mother and father made the mistake of thinking that because I conquered every task they set me, I was therefore obedient. I'm not. She reached the bottom of the stairs and turned around to face Olivia. Georgie! Olivia gasped. You're... this is wonderful! They also made the mistake of thinking that you were rebellious, simply because you recited limericks and generally carried on. But that was all flummery. You are the obedient daughter. 
Olivia stepped down beside her. I think I prefer being the rebel. I sound like a ninny. The Duke of Sconce would never be enticed by a ninny, Georgiana said with a grin. He's mad for you. I expected him to break out and announce that he had chosen you to be his wife at the luncheon table, but he managed to restrain himself. Just then, one of the footmen standing along the walls of the entryway sprang forward and swung open the great doors. Olivia turned, thinking it might be Quinn. Then she froze in place, unable to speak. The person at the door was, most decidedly, not Quinn. Georgiana experienced no such hesitation. Your Grace, she said, as Cleese ushered in the Duke of Canterwick. It is such a pleasure to see you. It's Rupert, Olivia blurted out. Something's happened to Rupert. No, the Duke turned his head and saw her. My dear, my dear, it's the best possible news. As Olivia later told Georgiana, she would have thought that the best possible news would refer to her own pregnancy, and she had very good reason to know that wasn't the case. Rupert has surpassed himself, the Duke shouted it, his entire face glowed with happiness. What? Breathed in glory, Cantwick said, still shouting. Crowned in it, Earl of Wellington mentioned him in the dispatches, Prince Regent informed, special honours considered. Good evening, Miss Georgiana, and how are you getting along with Sconce, then? Very well, thank you, Georgiana said, smiling. I am so happy to hear your news, Your Grace. Not as happy as I am, the Duke said, somewhat less fortissimo. Happy as not. I can't even describe what I'm feeling. Couldn't believe it at first. His Majesty's messenger had to tell me four times. Then I sent a man to Dover to wait for my son and bring him here as soon as he touches shore. Should be any day, the messenger said. I came straight here to share the news. I have to tell everyone. He interrupted his crowing and moved to Olivia, putting his hands on her shoulders and giving her a paternal shake. I can see that you're as dumbstruck as anyone, my dear. Well, it's the truth. I see there's a bit of a party tonight, which is splendid, splendid. I shall be able to tell everyone at once. And with that, he drew Olivia into the drawing room. The dowager moved forward with a smile. Quinn turned around from a conversation. Before either of them could greet him, Cantwick waved the assembly to silence as if he owned the house. He was something of an actor, Olivia thought, starting to get over the shock of his arrival and the astounding news he brought. First she had thought Rupert was dead, and now, now. As you may know, my son, the Marquis of Montsurry, is the major of the first company of Cantwick rifles, the Duke was saying, once again at a near shout. He rocked back and forth on his heels, the words tumbling out. For one reason or another, the rifles landed at Oporto in Portugal. Apparently, when my son discovered this error, he shaped up his men and took them across country to Badahoth, the fort of Badahoth. The entire room was wrapped, attention fixed on the Duke, except Quinn. His eyes were fixed on Olivia's back. Olivia could feel her shoulder blades prickling. As I'm sure you know, Badder Hoth has been under siege, under the command of General Thomas Picton. There had been many an attempt to scale the ramparts, some of them detailed in the London papers, but to no avail. Not, that is, until my son arrived. Olivia doubted that the Duke knew how triumphant his tone was whenever he said the words, My son. He's glowing. Georgiana murmured to her. Isn't it wonderful, Olivia? I mean, wonderful for Rupert. This will change everything for him. Olivia nodded. The general labelled the Cantwick rifles the forlorn hope, the Duke went on. That's the term they give to a company that has no hope of success. Forlorn hope. My son. Picton had to eat his words. I expect Picton didn't want to let them climb the ramparts, Olivia whispered back to Georgiana. 
It's rather nice to see that even a general can't stop Rupert once he puts his mind to something. He and his men surmounted those ramparts, although every other English company had failed, the Duke bellowed, scaled them and held them for several days until the Fifth Division was able to return. They'd given up, you see, given up and moved on, thinking the French were keeping the fort at Badahoff. They weren't, thanks to my son. Olivia couldn't stop herself. She glanced to her right. Quinn was looking at her. Their eyes met, and it felt as if a gulf had opened between them. Most of the French defenders retreated to San Cristobal and surrendered from there, the Duke said, his voice growing louder by the moment. The Marquis led his company up those ramparts, then held the fort and captured many French soldiers. Held it! With one hundred men, he held the whole fort! The Duke leveled a ferocious look around the room. There have been those who have said things behind my son's back, made fun of him. Never again. They're talking of the Order of the Bath, an honor held by twenty-four men at the most. My son. There was a moment of silence, and then, spontaneously, applause, spreading from hand to hand until the whole party was cheering, even tearful in some cases. The Duke suddenly turned to the side and caught Olivia's arm, pulled her to him. Miss Lytton believed in him, he said, looking around the room, fierce. I present to you my son's fiance, the future Marchioness of Montsorry. Olivia almost tripped, caught herself, smiled. The applause briefly grew louder then subsided as the Dowager Duchess of Sconce advanced majestically to stand before the Duke. In the perfect silence of the room, she dropped into a low and only slightly creaky curtsy. "'Your Grace,' she said, "'it will be the honour of this nation to welcome your son back to the shores of England, wreathed in rightly deserved glory.' Olivia did not look at Quinn again. She could not look. Chapter 23 Why Heroes Are Not As Much Fun As Dukes The dinner that followed the arrival of the Duke of Canterwick was never forgotten by any of the delighted and, after the joyous popping of champagne corks, inebriated guests, though there was one participant who, even years later, would remember feeling utter despair in the midst of all that celebration. Quinn wandered among the guests, feeling like a ghost a human shell with a semblance of a face, but no other distinctions than incredibly bad luck when it came to women. He danced with Georgiana after dinner. He tracked Olivia from the corner of his eye, saw how she passed from man to man, how they ogled her and laughed with her, and generally fell in love with her and into envy of the Marquis. Of course, no one would voice such a shabby emotion. Not tonight not after the French had surrendered that fort which had been so hard sought with lost English lives. He walked from room to room, because if he kept moving, people didn't try to stop him and talk of the Marquis. Envy was a pale word to describe the emotion he felt. It was more like rage, pure hatred, livid, bone-deep jealousy. His mother put a hand on his sleeve, stilled, let him go. He didn't know what she saw in his eyes. It didn't matter. The devil of it was, he would walk out of the room where Olivia was, and find himself walking back into it a moment later. He couldn't fool himself that he walked randomly. He tried to walk away. He found himself looking for her again and again. It seemed an eternity until the majority of guests retired to their rooms, and the still-excited and voluble duke was escorted to the Queen's chamber, so called because Queen Elizabeth had slept in it on three occasions. Quinn went to his chambers and bathed. He put on his dressing gown, then dismissed Waller and dressed himself all over again. He slipped out of his room, down the corridor, opened the door to Olivia's bedchamber, and entered. She sat with her back to him, toes stretched out toward the fire, reading a book just as in his dream. 
his body became a throbbing, aching torch. He approached silently, swept her silky hair to the side, and bent down to kiss her neck. His heart was pounding. He recognized the emotion flooding through his veins. He may not be the best at identifying emotion, but any fool could grasp this one. It was fear. Rupert had done it. He was a war hero now. A war hero. Olivia had the choice of marrying a man who stayed at home, no better than a man milliner, or marrying a man who scaled the ramparts, held the fort, and saved the day. Hell, Rupert might even have turned the tide of the war, he and his piddling hundred men. His lips touched her neck as he breathed in that delicate combination of flowers and mystery that was his Olivia, as he waited with a sense of dread that stretched from the tips of his fingers all the way to his soul, wherever that mysterious organ might be situated. He'd been in this state before, the first night Evangeline didn't come home. When she'd returned with the dawn light, she'd said that he was boring with his talk of nothing but mathematics until she wanted a scream— she had spent the night with a local squire. I couldn't say no, Evangeline had said dreamily. He had gone out on a hunt and startled a gang of smugglers, captured them all. He's a hero. Even months later, when the smugglers came to trial and turned out to have been starving villagers, desperately trying to poach rabbits in woods the squire liked to think of as his own, even then she'd still thought of the man as a hero. Now, here, Olivia's arms rose and caught him around the neck, cherry lips, a gleam in her eye that was for him alone. I'm sorry, he managed to say, but not until minutes or even an hour later. What for? He'd maneuvered her from the chair to the rug, firelight leaping here and there, flickering on her creamy skin. As it turned out, she was wearing nothing but a dressing gown, and though she had tried to keep it tied, he had managed to wrestle it open. Blood raced through his body, but it had to be said. You could have married a war hero if I hadn't taken your virginity. Every woman loves a hero. Isn't it wonderful for Rupert? she said, smiling. Absolutely. His voice was hollow, but he kept it in check. We won't have any problem finding him a wife now, she continued. Is something wrong, Quinn? You aren't jealous of poor Rupert, are you? There was only one answer to that. Yes. She came up on one elbow, put a soft hand on his cheek. Please don't tell me that you want to go to war. I can't. Too many responsibilities. But yes, I would like to. I've read Machiavelli, Julius Caesar, and de Saxe. I would like to do something that makes a difference in the world. I do see what you mean, she said, lying back and folding her arms behind her head. You're saying that you have to stay at home and take care of thousands of acres of land, and make sure hundreds of people in your care and working on your lands are fed and clothed and able to live another day. Wait, is that making a difference? She tapped her chin. No, you're right. Unless you can go over to France and kill some people, your life is wasted. Quinn made himself say the words, forcing them out of his mouth. Under the circumstances, do you still wish to marry me? She frowned at him. Which circumstances? Rupert's triumphs, or the battering ram episode of last night? Battering ram? Her indelicate simile caused him to momentarily lose track of the point, but he recovered. Because of Rupert's triumphs. Because you could marry a duke who seems likely to be one of the greatest heroes the British Empire has ever known. A little smile touched her lips. Why, that is true, isn't it? Yes. I could spend the rest of my life discussing what Lucy ate most recently— with a great national hero. Or I could lie on a rug with you. His heart was pounding in his ears. Naked, she added. Her eyes said everything. Vulnerable to attack by a b— Don't say that again, 
The clench in his heart eased. He stood up and pulled off his boots. She watched him with heavy-lidded eyes. He threw the shirt away, pulled down his breeches. Olivia. Hmm. A battering ram. He threw off his smalls, and her eyes went right to the spot. That is an accurate description, she stated. Just look at yourself. Quinn looked down. He was rampant, so to speak, and yes, formidable. We really shouldn't make love again until Montserrat is back in England, and has been informed of the change of circumstances. With a thrill of pure pleasure, he saw her eyes change and her lower lip droop. It seemed the battering ram wasn't all that terrifying. He dropped to his knees and drew his fingers sensuously down the slope of her cheek to her neck. Slower. That doesn't mean we have to be strangers. No, she whispered, winding her arms around his neck. He lowered his head, a low groan escaping from his chest. No. Chapter 24 Gallic Moustaches, A Friend in Need, and the Spirit of Adventure In later years, Olivia looked back on the evening she spent on the hearthrug, being ravished by a jealous, possessive, and altogether perfect duke, as a defining moment, the point that would forever separate her life before from that after. It was the night when she learned how breathtaking life could be, and it was followed by the morning when she learned how truly fragile and dear it is. She and Quinn had crawled into her curtained bed, slept in snatches, woken each other up, laughed and whispered, and explored each other. He departed as the sun was creeping over the horizon, having first told her exactly why the dawn rays stealing through the window were soft pink and not blinding white. She didn't even have to pretend to be fascinated. She genuinely was. Although she fell back to sleep thinking of the light in Quinn's eyes, rather than that coming in the window. The next thing she felt was a hand shaking her shoulder. Olivia, wake up! Wake up! The barely contained panic in Georgiana's voice cut through dreamy half-sleep and snapped Olivia's eyes open. What's the matter? Georgiana's sense of urgency was briefly derailed by her sense of decorum. Why aren't you wearing a nightgown? No, I don't want to know. Georgiana hauled back the curtains with a jangle of curtain rings. You must get dressed. Nora will be here in a moment, and she shouldn't see you in that state. What is it? Olivia pushed the covers back, swung her legs over the side of the bed, and looked around for her robe. It was very peculiar to wake up naked especially under the disapproving eye of her sister. Has something happened to mother or father? It's Rupert, Georgiana said, finding a discarded wrapper on the floor and throwing it at her. Put this on, for goodness sake. Rupert, Olivia said, jumping up. What has happened? Georgiana bit her lip. He's badly injured, Livy. There's some question whether he will survive. I feel so... Poor Rupert. Poor... Poor Rupert. Her eyes were bright with tears. And that's not all. The courier from Rupert's company no sooner told his father than the Duke fell to the ground. Dead? He's not dead, but he is insensible. He hasn't woken at all. The man arrived from Dover in the middle of the night, after we had all retired. Once Cantwick collapsed, the butler tried to find scones, but... He was here with me. I guessed as much. So Cleese woke the Duchess, and she summoned a physician. But Cantwick has not moved or spoken, and I gather the doctor is not hopeful. The Duke looks as if he were dead, but he still breathes. Olivia stood in the middle of the room, clutching the neck of her wrapper, and thinking as hard as she could. Is Rupert in London? I shall go to him immediately. He must be so frightened, and if his father cannot go to his side, then I must. Georgiana shook her head. He's in France. I think that's probably what his father found most shocking. In France? I don't know all the details, but the courier said his men were taking him up the coast of France, trying to bring him to Calais, where they were planning to cross the channel with the first boat they could commandeer. But 
Olivia, it's just so sad. His injuries are too grievous. So one of his soldiers came without him, bringing the message for Canterwick, and was directed on from Dover to here. Olivia sank back onto the bed, feeling temporarily overwhelmed. He is too injured to cross the channel. I'm afraid so. Georgiana sat down as well and wound an arm around her. He must be terribly afraid. Unless, perhaps, he's insensible? I don't think so. Apparently he asked for his father. I expect he asked for Lucy, too. And you. He's very fond of you, Georgiana said. His father would have gone to him if he had not suffered this attack, Olivia said, her heart thumping miserably. One must suppose so, but it's a terribly dangerous endeavour, given the war. Rupert got only as far as Normandy. He might be captured at any moment. Olivia stood up. I must go to him. Now. She hauled on the bell. I suppose I'll need a boat capable of crossing the channel. You would do better to travel by coach until you're at a point directly opposite Rupert, Georgiana said, and then gasped. But of course you're not going to France, Olivia. Don't be foolish. Nora appeared in the doorway. A bath. Olivia stated. Her maid had a rather smug smile on her face. I thought as much. She pushed the door open wider. Three footmen filed into the room, carrying buckets of water. And then a travelling gown, please, Olivia added. You cannot even consider such a rash gesture. Do you have any idea what the relationship between France and England is at the moment? What if you, you, are captured by the French, Olivia? Olivia considered that for a moment. Then she shrugged. We are at war. We have been at war for some time. We're still at war. I need to get to Rupert. I'm sure that any French soldiers I meet will understand. Her sister groaned. You haven't been reading the newspapers, have you? Would it surprise you to hear that the answer is no? The footman had left, and the bath was ready. Olivia tore off her wrapper again. If your sensibilities are going to be offended by my state of undress, Georgie, you had better leave now. You have nothing I don't have, her sister said, dropping onto a stool to the side of the bath. I just have more of it, Olivia murmured, poking a toe into the steaming water. You cannot take such a quixotic trip across the channel, Georgiana insisted. You haven't the faintest idea of the peril. I can live with the uncertainty, Olivia said. Nora, will you please wash my hair as quickly as humanly possible? Yes, miss, Nora said tackling Olivia's hair as if it were a bundle of laundry. Since you do know all the dangers and you read the newspapers, Georgie, you'd better tell me everything I absolutely have to know. Her sister started to protest, but Olivia held up her hand. You've known me longer than anyone else in the world. Do you really imagine that I would leave Rupert to die in some hut on the coast of France, alone? I may not have wanted to marry him, but I am fond of him. In an odd way, I truly respect him. There was a moment of silence, but for Nora's splashing. He is not your fiancé anymore, Georgiana said, but her voice betrayed the fact that she knew she couldn't win. Olivia shook her head. Stop. Then I am going with you. No, you certainly are not. Just how perilous is it to land on the French shore anyway? Olivia soaped an arm while she waited for an answer. According to the newspapers, French soldiers are constantly patrolling the beaches, looking for an invasion force and also for smugglers. You could be captured. Why on earth would they want to capture me? Her sister stared at her. Do I really need to spell out what soldiers are capable of doing to women, Olivia? Ravished by a Frenchman, Olivia said lightly. There are those who pay for the privilege. Georgiana gasped. How can you respond with, with a vulgarity to such a terrible prospect? I do not mean to belittle the terribleness of such an event, Georgie, but if I have learned anything during my betrothal to Rupert, it is that dwelling on the worst possibilities is not helpful. Therefore, I choose to picture any French soldier I might encounter as seductive and gallant. She spoke the last word using the French pronunciation, and considered... Perhaps with a moustache that curls at the edges. 
I will never understand you. Just how gallant will those soldiers be if they believe you to be a spy? A spy? Me? I look nothing like a spy. Who knows what a spy looks like? I have a definite understanding that there are women engaged in that business. I wonder if you're even allowed to ransom spies the way you can, officers. Thank goodness you read the paper so assiduously, Olivia said. Perhaps you can find out the answer to that question before my need becomes pressing. She stood up, letting the water sluice from her. Nora, I'm sure you've gathered that I will need a small travelling bag. I will accompany you to France, miss, Nora said stoutly. You will need someone to dress you, even in a French prison. Olivia's smile included her maid and sister. Neither of you is coming with me. You cannot go alone, Georgiana protested. Then, oh, exactly. You must send the Duke a note now, if you intend to leave immediately, Georgiana said, asking him to accompany you. She moved toward the little writing desk in the corner. I am quite certain that the Duke is already preparing for the journey, Olivia said calmly. Thank you, Nora. That is a perfect choice for travelling. Doubtless all the best spies wear dark plum. It will blend with the night, the little maid said, her voice squeaking with excitement. Georgiana shook her head. How do you know that His Grace is prepared? May I remind you, Olivia, that you met Sconce all of four days ago? Olivia grinned at her. That man longs to serve the nation. If being a spy will allow him to, he'll be a spy. He positively writhed with jealousy at the idea of Rupert's going to war. He'll accompany me. And what will the dowager say to that? Nora shivered. They do say below stairs that the duke generally does whatever her grace demands. She will not be happy, Georgiana persisted. I would venture to say that unhappy doesn't approach her feelings on the subject, Olivia said, considering the matter. But there's this to be said about it. If Quinn stays in England because of his mother's objections, then he is not a man whom I wish to marry. A test? Georgiana asked, her tone rather dubious. Olivia nodded. Do you remember that old story of the lady who was decreed to be a real princess because a pea had been hidden under her mattress? Well, this is my version. No prince is real if he obeys his mother. Rather than his fiancée? Georgiana asked. Rather than the spirit of adventure? Chapter 25 The Matter of a Parental Blessing Quinn was in his gunroom, assessing the rather extraordinary number of weapons collected by his forebears. In the end, after careful consideration of what lay ahead, he chose a pair of small but deadly Italian pocket pistols. I trust these have been oiled recently, he asked Cleese. Absolutely, Your Grace. Quinn handed Cleese the pistols and watched absent-mindedly as the butler wrapped them tenderly in a fold of flannel and replaced them in a specially made case emblazoned with the sconce coat of arms. One duke upstairs dead to the world. The heir to that dukedom on a beach in France, dead, or very nearly so. He felt as though he were living in a novel, the kind with an improbable plot and histrionic characters. At any moment a piece of armour or something equally preposterous would fall from the sky. We'll take a boat from Dover, he told Cleese, watching him pack bags of powder and shot in the case. Send a footman ahead to engage the best captain and vessel available. We'll anchor offshore and take a rowboat with muffled oars under cover of dark. With any luck, the Marquis will be on English soil by tomorrow night. I trust that will be the case, Clee said, looking as unconvinced as Quinn felt. The door popped open. There you are. Quinn looked up and felt a surge of emotion so strong that he was dizzy. Olivia was dressed for travel. In the crisis, he had forgotten how beautiful she was. Those green eyes, the colour of sea glass, the mouth that was made for kissing. Are you nearly ready? she asked. The very idea of allowing her on a boat, anywhere near the channel, was unnerving, and yet he knew that he had no choice. 
We must leave immediately, she said. He saw anxiety in her eyes, but her smile was bright and brave. What on earth are you carrying? he asked, as she carefully put a basket on the ground. Lucy, of course, she answered. I'm afraid she's not very happy with the basket, but I don't want to risk her falling into the sea. He stepped forward and took her hands, looking down into those lovely eyes. Will you please remain here at Littlebourne in safety, while I go to fetch Rupert? I will have the Marquis at your side within twenty-four hours, if it's humanly possible. I'm sure his condition has improved while the courier was travelling to us. Olivia's smile widened. I had to try, he muttered, as much to himself as to her. Your mother is waiting for you in the drawing room. Quinn took the pistol case from Cleese. With it, he was as prepared to protect his lady as he possibly could be. He was a crack shot, but he knew perfectly well that aim and a well-oiled pistol would go only so far. He would need luck. Olivia stood at his left shoulder. Quinn, did you hear me? Your mother is waiting for you in— He turned and dropped a kiss on her lips. I did hear you. I shall pay a quick farewell to her grace directly. Please, will you dispatch that footman to Dover, then collect my travelling bag from Waller, and make certain that Miss Lytton is comfortable in the carriage? Olivia had turned pink and rather flustered. You mustn't kiss me in front of people, she whispered. Kiss you? he asked. Then, please, close your eyes. As always, the butler was prompt and obedient, and Quinn kissed his lady again, hard and fast. Is this better? he whispered back, his voice roughened by a potent combination of desire and fear. Our inestimable Cleese did not see that particular intimacy. But may I point out, dear heart, that our butler knows everything that happens in this household, and was undoubtedly aware of my intention to marry you, even before I was. Please, I must beg you to pay no heed to your master, Olivia said, rolling her eyes. He's clearly succumbed to the stress of the situation. She moved toward the door, slipping away from his grasp. Truly, Quinn, we must hurry. I am worried that we will arrive too late. Her expression rather stricken, she added. That is, I want to find Rupert as soon as possible. Quinn caught her hand, pulled her back to him, and gave her an open-mouthed, hungry kiss, the kind he'd been thinking about ever since he left her at the break of dawn. When he at last raised his head, she was sagging against him, her breathing unsteady. I will kiss you he stated, looking into her eyes, before Cleese, or before the regent himself. Olivia blinked up at him, growing a little teary. Or the Pope, he began punctuating his sentence with small kisses. Or the Emperor of Siam, or the Archbishop of Canterbury. A voice came from the doorway. Tarquin. He raised his head and nodded, acknowledging his mother. Then he looked back down at his future wife and dropped another kiss on her rosy lips. Before any and every member of my family, including my saintly aunt, Lady Velopia Sybil, who would prefer that people communicated only with the deity of her choice, and then only in prayer. Olivia shook her head at him. I shall be in the Landau. She paused before the dowager and dropped into a low curtsy, head bent. Your Grace, you may characterize this as a housemaid scuttle if you wish. As you have doubtless surmised, I'm leaving for France, Quinn told his mother as Olivia disappeared into the corridor. I expect to return tomorrow, either with a wounded Marquis or the body of an English hero. It need hardly be said that I am hoping for the former. By all accounts, including her own, Miss Lytton did not request your company on this foolhardy errand the dowager pronounced. Her face wore an expression of grievous injury, and her hands were clasped like a marble saint's. The comparison ended there. The only female saint he could think of with a voice as commanding as his mother's was Joan of Arc. Miss Lytton did not have to ask for my escort, he confirmed. However, I shall go to France, with or without her. 
May I accompany you to the drawing room, mother? The tide waits for no man, and I intend to be in Dover in three hours. Given the present inclement political situation, I would prefer that you did not travel to France. I am aware of that. He was running through lists in his head, trying simultaneously to soothe his mother and do the very thing that was terrifying her. Please, please have some rope and a dark lantern put in the carriage. Oh, and a flint. His mother ignored both his statement and the presence of the butler. I must ask, nay, demand, that you reconsider this rash and dangerous venture. Montsurry is undoubtedly at the point of death, if not already dead. I questioned Sergeant Grouper, the soldier who arrived in the middle of the night, and he described the Marquis as barely able to raise his head from his pallet. That was a full twenty-four hours ago. He is surely dead by now. If the Marquis has died, then I shall repatriate his body to England, Quinn said firmly, guiding his mother down the corridor toward the drawing room. He is a war hero. It is the least any English citizen could do for him. Why must it be you? the dowager cried, the words bursting from her mouth in an uncharacteristically urgent, not to say emotional, manner. We could appeal to the Navy. His Majesty would send a force, or we could hire Bow Street runners. From what I hear, they could take on a French battalion without any effort. His Majesty cannot risk the impression that a British force is attacking the shores of France, and the Royal Navy would face the same problem. But these are academic issues. There is no time to lose. I am beholden to Montsurry. I shall do this myself. You most certainly are not beholden to Montsurry. Did you not tell me that you'd never met him? They had reached the entry, and Quinn stopped. Mother, you know why I'm beholden to the Marquis, and you also know precisely why I would never allow Olivia. Miss Lytton, he said steadily, you understand why I would never allow Olivia to cross the channel without me. She was so pale that her rouge stood out in patches on each cheek. This rash, imprudent effort is foolhardy in the extreme. The French will shoot at first sight, and you haven't even been on the water since your wife died. Quinn's hand curled into a fist. It is true that I have not been across the channel, but only because I have had no need to travel to the continent. Quinn's even tone concealed the pit in his chest, that had yawned open at the mere idea of crossing the same stretch of water that had swallowed his son. A duke should never be prey to such emotion, and he ruthlessly pushed it away. Evangeline's death is irrelevant. Montsurry needs me. Olivia needs me. And frankly, mother, I could not face the Duke of Canterwick, should he recover his senses, knowing I had not made every effort to bring his son home. His mother swallowed hard. Cantwick would not do the same for you. As with Evangeline's death, that is irrelevant. We will put to sea at Dover, and the voyage should be a mere four hours with a good wind. I expect to be home tomorrow. Smugglers do this every day, you know. I am afraid of that water, the dowager said, her voice tight as a violin string. I almost lost you to it before. Quinn nodded. They both knew there was more than one way to be lost. He picked up his mother's hand and brought it to his lips. You raised me to be a duke, mother. I would disgrace my own title if I allowed a man of my rank to die on a foreign shore through my own cowardice. I wish I'd raised you to be a peasant, his mother said, her voice low. Your grace, he said, bowing with a low sweep that signalled his deep respect for his mother. She raised her chin, and then slowly descended into a curtsy of her own. I would prefer not to be proud of a son who is walking into clear danger, she remarked, her eyes shining with tears. I will take your blessing with me, Quinn said, ignoring her words and answering the look in her eyes. That was something he was learning from Olivia. If he concentrated, he could tell what people were feeling— just from looking carefully at their eyes. 
his mother turned and swept up the stairs, her shoulders rigid, her head high. Chapter 26 The Dangers of Poetry Under the Moon It was almost three hours since they left the port at Dover, in a vessel named the Daydream, a schooner with a small cabin lying just above the surface of the water. Olivia stood at the porthole, watching black water fall restlessly behind their prow, as if it had somewhere to go. "'We'll take the rowboat up an inlet, if I understand you,' Quinn said from behind Olivia's shoulder. He was poring over a detailed map of the French coast with Sergeant Grouper, the soldier who had come to fetch them. Though to be exact, Grouper had come to fetch Rupert's father. Poor Canterwick, he still lay as if dead. Olivia had visited him before they set out, and had told him that she was going to France to find Rupert and bring him home. Perhaps he heard her. Oi, Grouper said, the hut is just here. His stubby finger landed on a tiny inlet. I memorized that town. Wizard. His finger moved again. Wizard, Quinn corrected him. I believe it means white sands. Olivia hugged her cloak tighter around her. Quinn had been interrogating Grouper for more than two hours, grilling him on the exact route up the French coast taken by Rupert's men. They'd been in a sloop, desperate to avoid capture. They had faced no problems until Rupert's condition became so precarious that they were afraid to keep travelling. Burning up, Grouper said from behind her. Babbling of green fields and the like. And a lady he left behind. Olivia turned and smiled faintly at the soldier. May I inquire whether he was asking for someone named Lucy? That's it. All the way down the coast, it seemed. Lucy and more Lucy. He eyed her. I'm thinking your Christian name might be Lucy, ma'am. No, Mr. Grouper. This is Lucy. She gestured toward the little dog sleeping in a basket at her feet. Grouper's bushy eyebrows flew up. First time I've heard a man make such a fuss over a dog. I don't mind telling you that. Olivia felt no need to explain Rupert, nor his devotion to Lucy, and merely nodded. Quinn was bent over the map, evidently memorizing every tiny crevice on the coastline. His coat was pulled tight over his shoulders, emphasizing their breadth. His cheekbones stood out more prominently than usual, and that white shock of hair fell over his brow. What worries me most is that there's a garrison here, damn close to the hut, Quinn said, his finger sliding over from the inlet where Rupert could be found. Have you seen soldiers conducting drills thereabouts? I wasn't there but half an hour, Grouper said. I'm not a man who's a dab hand at the sickbed. I set out for England the moment we had the Major settled on a pallet. He hadn't much time. He shook his head. I still see his father every time I close my eyes, just listing to the side like that, and then falling on the floor. I should have told his lordship more gentle-like. I just blurted it out. It wasn't you, Olivia said. It was the distressing news, not you. No matter how you had phrased it, the Duke stands to lose his only son, whom he loves very much. I saw that, Grouper said. And I don't mind telling you that every man in the company feels the same about the Major. The forlorn hope. That's what they called us. Cause we weren't supposed to come to nothing and... He stuck out his jaw. We was the men that no one else wanted. Did you know that? Olivia shook her head. The other recruiters for the army wouldn't take us. And we were just left behind, for one reason or another. They thought I was too old though I know the battlefield as well, if not better than any man. There was a few who had been lamed in the service, and they were told they should just go home. Olivia made a sympathetic noise. Go home? Go home and do what? Take up knitting? You don't tell a soldier to go home just because he lost a few toes or has a gammy leg? But the Marquis didn't agree, she prompted. In the beginning... I was as nervous as any. He doesn't think the same as the rest of us, that was plain. But then I saw what he was about, and once I saw that, 
I would have followed him anywhere. Olivia beamed at him. Up the ramparts, in fact. That's right. See, the other companies, as had tried before, they always went in the middle of the night, thinking to surprise the frogs. But of course they didn't. Well, the Major, he said we would just walk up there around noon or so and do it. He didn't seem to be worried about it at all, and so none of us were either. That's the attitude of a born leader, Quinn said. He had straightened, pushed the map to the side, and now leaned on the table, listening. Grouper nodded. By then, we'd marched across Portugal to Badajoz, and we knew he was a decent chap. Listened to us, he did, and told us what he thought, and didn't talk down. He paused. Mind you, he was an odd thinker. That was a kind way of putting it, to Olivia's mind. So you took the fort? Easy as pie, Grouper said, his chest swelling with pride. See, the frogs was all eating, and when they eat, they eat. They go three courses, four, five, all of them, even down to the lowest soldier. The Major, he worked it out. He'd had a French tutor, see, and he knew what they were like, and he told us in a way so we could all understand it, too. Olivia smiled. She loved thinking of Rupert being greeted with respect, rather than less than thinly veiled contempt. We knocked out a few sentries right off, and then we just took the fort, and we didn't kill many of them French soldiers either. We let them run straight from the lunch table to San Cristobal. The Major, he doesn't hold with killing, not unless you have to save your own life. Olivia smiled. That's Rupert. Did the Marquis sustain his injury in the fight? Quinn said. Grouper shook his head. It was the damnedest thing, if you'll pardon me, my lady. We was all done, and we held the fort for three days, till the English forces could get back to us. They didn't think we had a chance, you see. Not after all the earlier attempts had failed. The disgust in his voice spoke for itself. We held that fort, and we did it nice, too. We had all the frogs in the stockade, but we gave them blankets and plenty of food, because the Major said that a Frenchman deprived of his food will fight like a cornered rat. Sure enough, once they were all snug and well fed, they didn't seem to mind much. Never even tried to get out. Then what happened? Olivia asked. The Major? Well, he liked to walk about on those battlements at night, Grouper said. The guard up there, he cleared his throat. Well, he said as how the Major was reciting poetry. The last word came out reluctantly, as if he were confessing that Rupert had begun smoking opium. Reciting poetry is not generally considered to be a hazardous activity, Quinn observed. Not one for poetry myself, Grouper acknowledged managing to imply that he considered poetry to belong in the same category as treason. The Major was up on those battlements, walking around and looking at the moon, and he took a header. He was looking at the moon. We found a scrap of paper behind, with a bit of verse on it, all about the moon. At any rate, the fool knocked his brains about. He didn't even wake up for a day, and we thought he was gone for sure. But then he started talking of this Lucy. We thought she was his lady wife, so we decided as how we should get him back to England. Wellington's doctor, he said that we had to wait till the Major died and just bring back the body. I'm glad you didn't wait, Olivia put in. The Major wasn't like the rest of them commanders. He really cared. Grouper's voice was a bit rough. We put him in a cart and brought him to the shore. Then we took a sloop and brought him up the north coast of France easy as pie. And we would have come across to England, except we thought it was making him worse with the pitching of the waves. It hurt his head. Olivia put a hand on Grouper's sleeve. You did just the right thing. His father may not have been able to say this before he collapsed, but he is tremendously grateful to you. As am I. The sergeant looked at his hands and said, 
if in we'd known Lucy was a dog, I don't know that we would have done it. In that case, I'm glad you had no idea. We must be nearing the shore, Quinn said, breaking in. Olivia, you will wait here with Sergeant Grouper. He seemed to think that he had the ultimate say in that matter. The captain will drop anchor, and I will take the rowboat to the hut and fetch the Marquis. No, Olivia said, keeping her tone even. I intend to be in that rowboat. I beg to differ. I did not come all this way to sit safely offshore. If Rupert is alive, he may not be well enough to venture a ride in a rowboat, as, indeed, Grouper and his fellow soldiers surmised. When we first discussed this possibility, we did not realize that there is a garrison of French soldiers a hand's breadth from the hut. I am extremely doubtful that Rupert and the two men who remained at his side are still at liberty. Olivia pressed her lips together before they could tremble. It is true that Rupert is not a very lucky person. I am certain that we can retrieve his body from the French if we pay enough, Quinn said bluntly. We will bring it back to England, and he will be buried with honours, as befits his rank and his deeds. But you need not risk yourself in that particular endeavour, Olivia. I will bring Rupert home. There was a fierceness in his voice that turned the words into a vow. Now tears were pressing against her eyes. Other than his father, Rupert had never had a champion, and now he had this magnificent, uncompromising duke. She felt sure that Quinn would never allow the slightest insult against his erstwhile rival. Rupert would have been honoured to know you, she said, her voice unsteady, despite her best efforts. And I shall be in that rowboat with you. No. If you do not permit me to accompany you, I will join you a few moments after I strike poor Grouper on the head and swim to shore. No need for that, Grouper said. He seemed to be enjoying the skirmish. Never let it be said that I came between a married couple. We are not married, Quinn said, eyes fixed on Olivia. Grouper shook his head. And here I thought nobility didn't have the loose ways of the rest of us. You surely fight as if you'd taken the vows. I am an excellent swimmer, Olivia insisted, ignoring the sergeant's less than helpful comments. She was trying to make a point, but the moment the words left her mouth and she saw the pain that flashed through Quinn's eyes, she realized she had made a terrible misstep. She was at his side in an instant, her arms tight around his waist. I won't go in the water. I promise I won't go in the water. She brushed her lips across his. If Rupert is still alive, I must be with him. He will recognize me. He has never met you. I'll bring Lucy with me. Olivia knew in her heart of hearts that she had to have her way on this. You cannot make this decision for me. You won't be safe. His voice was ragged, raw. Though they scarcely noticed him, Grouper went up the steps to the deck gently shutting the door behind him. You cannot keep me safe. She pulled him closer until she could feel his hard chest against her. I cannot keep you safe either. Damn it, Olivia. These idiots stowed Rupert in a hut under the very noses of a whole garrison of French soldiers. If the Frenchmen were to capture you, no. They will not capture me, she said. She felt the knife-like agony in his eyes sink into her own heart. I didn't come all the way to France simply to wait in the daydream. Then she had an inspiration. They won't capture me, because I will be with you. With me? Quinn muttered, his jaw clenched. I want to remain with you. Not only will I be safer, but I couldn't bear the tension of not knowing how you were faring. She felt a pang of guilt. She was manipulating him. What if those soldiers catch glimpse of the daydream? They will not, he said flatly. We will anchor offshore and shut at the lantern. But his eyes searched her face. He was listening to her. I cannot leave him to die alone. She put every bit of willpower she had in her voice. Dear heart. He rubbed his thumb gently along the line of her lower lip. Rupert is dead.
I'm trying to work out how to carry his body down the inlet without alerting soldiers. And if by some remote chance he is alive, I will have Lucy with me. Surely she will be introduction enough. No! She'd never thought, never imagined, that someone like Quinn could love her. Still, she understood instinctively that he had to, he absolutely had to, respect her. He had to trust her even when his instinct was to deny her. His father is gone. I am the only person in the world who cares for him, Quinn. The only one. I must go to him. She held his eyes. My personal safety is immaterial. This is a question of ethics. There was a moment of tense silence. You have a point, Quinn finally said, his voice reluctant. She held her breath. His arms tightened about her. You are Olivia, after all. What do you mean? She whispered. You love your sister enough to give me up. You love Rupert, the poor scrambled egg. You love Lucy with her bitten eyelid. You even love your misguided parents. She cleared her throat. You omitted one person in that list. You are the most loyal person I know. You will never give up Rupert's secrets. You will never steal a man whom your sister wants. Therefore, obviously you could not live with yourself if you did not make every effort to be with Rupert. Olivia opened her mouth to say something about love, something about how much she loved the complicated, harsh, and altogether fascinating man who stood before her. But there was a splash, followed by the sound of an anchor being lowered as quietly as possible. Very well, Quinn said tightly. I don't like it, but I understand. Olivia reached up on tiptoes and brushed a kiss across his lips again. I love you. His hands tightened on her arms, and he kissed her. He said nothing, but it didn't matter. Olivia understood love as well as any other woman, and when a man looked at a woman with desire and possession and caring all mixed up, he loves her, whether he articulates it or no. She smiled. The rowboat is waiting for us. It's time to go. Chapter 27 And Miles to Go Before I Sleep Up on the deck, the first thing Quinn realized was that the rowboat was far too small, hardly bigger than his bathtub. It would barely take his weight, let alone his and Olivia's, and it certainly couldn't take a third person, dead or alive. The captain of the daydream leaned close, his voice low. It's the only one I have with muffled oars. It slips through the water with no more sound than a man pissing in a pond. For those with a need to reach the shore quiet-like, this is the one. The man showed every sign of being a smuggler. Quinn paused, then nodded, consciously releasing the tension in his jaw. If they survived the next few hours, he didn't want to keel over like Rupert's father. He had noted that tension had an extremely deleterious effect on the human body. Two dead dukes, both betrothed to Olivia, and neither with a surviving heir, would be absurd. He cautiously lowered himself from the schooner into the little boat and reached up for Olivia, whom the captain helped down. They had to sit with their legs sharply bent, knees pressed against knees. Lucy clutched in Olivia's arms. The pang of desire he always felt at her touch— ordinarily so thrilling, was now an irritant, a spur to his underlying sense of panic. But he slipped the muffled oars into the water, and indeed the boat made no more sound than a reed in the wind. Rocks reared on the port side, and in the near distance a blur of sand shone in the moonlight. He mentally calculated the exact place where the inlet let into the sea, and was gratified to catch a patch of darkness just where he'd predicted it would be. Somewhere a curlew called a night anthem, notes tumbling with the gentle sound of the waves. Olivia's eyes were shining. I love the smell of the sea, she whispered, her voice just a thread of sound in the night. In truth, 
The water didn't smell like the terrible engulfing entity that had stolen his son. It smelled like brine and seaweed, and reminded him of his childhood, when every physical quality of the world was a mystery waiting to be solved. Ahead of them was a bright spark in the darkness, slightly to the right of the inlet. He tapped Olivia on the knee, pointed. Rupert. The garrison. He pulled to the port side, heading straight for the dark shadow that signaled the mouth of the inlet. Perhaps they truly would be lucky, in and out like a fox. Then the little boat was slipping up the inlet, which was overhung with branches, just as Grouper had described. All the while, Quinn was calculating how to bring the three of them back down the inlet, given the size of the rowboat. It was not possible. He would have to take Olivia back to the daydream, get her safely aboard, then return for Rupert's body. The boat slid like a ghost through the water, and the stream bent slightly to the right again. A second later, they nosed onto the beach. Quinn clambered to shore, made the boat fast, and turned to help Olivia and Lucy. He held her for a moment. I don't want you here, he whispered. Let's go, she said her voice brushing his ear. He took her hand. It was hell to care about someone. How could he have forgotten that? He used to worry about Alfie every time he was ill. Anxiety was tiresome. They climbed up the bank and veered to the left. In his mind's eye, he followed Grouper's finger on the map, translating map distances into steps. If there were ever a situation in which his mathematical skill was useful, this was it. They moved silently forward, feeling their way as much as seeing it. After a time, the dark exterior wall of a hut loomed precisely where it should be. Quinn put a hand on Olivia's shoulder and tightened it in a silent message. She nodded, her eyes huge in the moonlight. He followed the wall of the hut, turned the corner, and pushed gently on the door. Inside, there was a faint brush of movement. Instantly, he whispered, God save the king! The door swung inwards. Quinn walked into total darkness and waited until the door shut behind him. Then a dark lantern slid open. Its wavering flame illuminated the faces of two drawn and exhausted English soldiers. Thank God you've come, one of them breathed. He lives. A jerky nod of the head. Barely. Your names. Togs. Another jerk of his head. That's Paisley. Quinn nodded at the lantern. They shut it again, and he slipped out, returning with Olivia, her hand warm in his. When the lantern was opened once more, its light shone on the clear panes of her face, the glowing strands of hair escaping from under her hood, the generous line of her lower lip. Lucy! Toggs gasped. There was a wealth of meaning in his voice. They thought she was worth risking their lives for. Quinn could see it in both men's eyes. A silent growl rose in his throat, startling him. Olivia shook her head, unloosed her cape, and put Rupert's little dog on the floor. She smiled at the bewildered faces and pointed. This is Lucy. The Marquis, Quinn asked. He had stopped thinking about corpses and was now desperately calculating how to get both Olivia and a grievously injured Rupert back in that tiny rowboat. His remaining behind was out of the question. Olivia couldn't row far enough to reach the daydream. He would have to take one, then return for the other, which meant that he would have to leave one temporarily behind. Toggs shook his head and drew back a rough curtain in the corner, revealing a slight figure lying on a thin mattress on the floor. Olivia rushed over and fell to her knees. Lucy was already there, nosing her master's cheek, her thin tail wagging madly. She picked up Rupert's hand. It was odd to realize only now that his fingers were long and delicate. They weren't like Quinn's powerful grip, but they were beautiful in their own way. She leaned close and said, Rupert. He didn't stir. Lucy pressed close to Olivia, trembling, and then she suddenly took a little hop and landed on Rupert's chest. Olivia reached out to remove her, but the dog was licking his cheek his nose, his eyelids. Instead, Olivia said, low and urgent, Rupert, I've brought Lucy to you. It's Lucy. His eyelids trembled. 
she rubbed his hand faster and glanced over her shoulder at Quinn. He's waking, she mouthed. Lucy was still licking Rupert, her warm tongue bathing his cheek, his ear. He opened his mouth and rasped one word. Lucy. Olivia bent even closer. Rupert, it's Olivia. Lucy and I have come to take you back home. For a second, he said nothing. Then his eyes slowly focused on Lucy's brown pointed nose and shining eyes. A smile trembled on his bloodless lips. His eyes moved to Olivia. Knew you'd come. The words were slurred. Olivia saw with a lurch of her stomach a trickle of dried blood leading from his ear. She felt a sob rising in her throat. He didn't... he didn't look as if he had long to live. Quinn's hand came on her shoulder and squeezed. He squatted down beside the pallet. Lord Mons. She shook her head. Quinn started over, his voice calm and deep. Rupert, we've come to take you home. Rupert's eyes wandered for Lucy. Oh, my name is Quinn. Ah, his eyes were closing. Miles to go. Yes, Quinn agreed. He saw the truth of it in Rupert's face before the man even spoke. Too many miles. Olivia's hand closed around Quinn's wrist. We must take him now to the boat. Now. Otherwise, he will die here, in this hovel. Rupert didn't look like someone with the indomitable will that had driven a company of one hundred men over the walls of a fortress. There was a kind of acceptance about his face that spoke for itself. Quinn thought he would almost certainly die very soon. We cannot remain here for more than a few hours at the most, he said. The Frenchies almost caught us this morning, Togs put in. We heard them coming. They were set to enter the hut, but one of the dogs startled a duck, and they went after their supper instead. We didn't have a boat, because we sent Grouper over in it. Quinn frowned, looking at the silent Paisley. He don't speak, Tog said. Not even a word. He's the best sailor of us. He got the boat all the way here, but he couldn't come across to fetch you, because he don't speak. The Major said as how it didn't matter to him as long as Paisley could hold a gun the right way up. The silent man nodded. You both stayed with him, Olivia said, her smile, warm despite her fear, lingering on each of their exhausted faces. He's our commander, Tog said, and Paisley nodded tersely. They were good men. Quinn had to get them out as well, before the French stumbled by the hut again in the morning and decided to explore. Tension mounted in Quinn's chest. Rupert was near death, and the two soldiers were exhausted to the point of collapse. He would bet that they'd had little, if anything, to eat in the last few days. He crouched down, close enough to catch the warm, flowery scent that was Olivia, and said quietly, I must leave you here for a short time, dear heart. She turned her face, and her lips brushed his, sweet and heady. That's exactly what I was thinking. I'll be back for you, an hour at the most. Quinn realized that Rupert's eyes had drifted open again and that he was watching them. Happy you. The words floated on the air. Quinn had to clear his throat. I'm going to carry you to the boat. He slipped one hand under Rupert's torso and discovered that he weighed almost nothing. Take Lucy he whispered to Olivia. Olivia retrieved the little dog from Rupert's chest, but stopped Quinn before he could pick up the injured man. Rupert looked very ill and impossibly young. He didn't seem sixteen, let alone eighteen. You did it, Rupert, Olivia whispered, leaning close. Your father is so happy and so proud of you. You have crowned the Canterwick name with glory. Even in the low light, she could see a faint smile in his eyes, a tired smile. And you're also a wonderful poet, she said, cupping his cheek with her hand. 
You must heal, so that you can write more poetry. He shook his head, just slightly. The truth of it was in his face. Olivia's eyes filled with tears. Then fly, Rupert. Be free. Leave all this darkness to us. The smile was there again. He turned his head, just slightly, lips against her hand, and closed his eyes. Olivia stayed still for a moment, a tear splashing onto the rough blanket. Then Quinn ran a hand over her hair, and she rose. She waited until Quinn was standing with Rupert in his arms. If he fails, she told him, you cannot leave him. He must not die on that boat with no one but Grouper by his bed. Do you hear me? Her voice was barely above the sound of a nesting bird, and yet he heard every word. Olivia, no. It was a plea and a protest at once. The French patrol in the morning, she said. Not until morning. Her eyes moved back to Rupert's face. She was right. Rupert probably didn't have until the morning. But if they waited in the hut, men had taken more than the few hours that remained until dawn to die. And if that were the case, they would all be caught. Olivia handed Quinn Lucy's cord, and he wound it around his wrist. Outside, the night hair still hung heavy, with no hint of dawn. He had time to row down the little inlet, out to the daydream. Time to make Rupert comfortable. He had time. When they were settled in the rowboat, an operation that required considerable finesse, given the boat's diminutive proportions, Rupert stopped breathing. Lucy gave a little whimper and licked his cheek. Rupert's chest moved again. Quinn bent to the oars, but he had to be silent, silent. He couldn't row too vigorously or the oars would catch the water and splash. When at last he reached the daydream, Grouper was waiting at the gunwale. With the soldier hauling from above, getting Rupert on board was quick work. But at the sight of his beloved Major unconscious, Grouper's eyes grew large. He was a man of action, the one who had crossed the channel to alert Rupert's family, but he was not a man who could stand to see a man suffering. They managed to get Rupert into the bed, and Quinn drew the blanket to Rupert's chin and placed Lucy at his side. The journey from the hut, although short as the crow flies, had been punishingly arduous, and he could see that for Rupert it had been excruciating. His face was even more drawn, and his breathing, the shallow respiration of a man at the limit of his tolerance. His thin fingers clenched Lucy's fur. Brandy! Quinn barked over his shoulder, only to realize that Grouper, his capabilities exhausted, had fled to the deck. He wrenched open a cabinet and snatched a bottle, which turned out to be the finest French cognac, the kind even dukes drank only sparingly. Oh, for the life of a smuggler. Turning back, he dribbled a little brandy into Rupert's mouth. The Marquis gasped, his eyes flickered open. A familiar feeling of helplessness clutched Quinn's heart. He knew he should say something, but he had no idea what. It was rather as if he were facing Evangeline again, when she would accuse him of being no more emotional than a piece of wood, and he hadn't the faintest idea what she wanted from him. Probably Rupert would like to hear poetry, but Quinn didn't know any poetry. His tutors had never bothered with that sort of thing. His mind spun with furious frustration. If only Rupert wanted information about wave patterns. Who? Rupert's eyes searched his face confused. I'm Olivia's friend, Quinn reminded him. We brought Lucy to see you, and we've come to take you home to your father, to England. Rupert's fingers curled around Lucy's ear, and he gave it a little tug. Lucy nudged his hand. Too many miles, he said. Quinn silently agreed with Rupert. What was one supposed to say to a dying person? A psalm, he thought, except he couldn't remember any. Sleep, Rupert said, his eyes drifting shut again. Suddenly, somehow, Rupert's poem came back to Quinn, 
as clearly as if Olivia had recited it to him a moment ago. Before it could vanish, he said it aloud. Quick, bright, the bird falls down to us. Darkness piles up in the trees. It made no sense in this context, but he said it again, more slowly. Rupert's face brightened, and he said something, so quietly Quinn almost didn't catch it. And they fly. A long silence. His breath stopped. Started again. Quinn looked desperately at the porthole. There was no sign of dawn yet. He knew what Olivia would say. He knew what she wanted. He knew. Rupert's chest stopped moving again. Then he took another breath, like a little gasp. So Quinn sat, holding tight to the hand of the man who was giving him Olivia, who had written a poem that spoke to Alfie's death, who was flying with sparrows fallen from trees. And all the time, the dearest person in his life was back there on a foreign shore without him, guarded only by two exhausted and trembling soldiers. Damn, but he must love her too. The thought cracked like thunder in his head. He froze, noting that Rupert had stopped breathing again, but he'd done that before. Love. His mother had told him when he was only a child that love. What had she said about love? That it was dangerous and not for people of their rank. That it was impulsive and the sign of someone foolish and ill-bred. But when did she say that he wasn't able to love? He loved Olivia more than life. More than light, more than anything. The analytical part of his brain, which had been counting silently, spoke up, suggested that the bird was winging its way through some other sky, a silent sky. Quinn looked down and saw that it was true. Rupert was gone. Gently, Quinn disengaged his hand and tucked Rupert's sheet more securely about him. Lucy was curled next to her master's body. She lifted her long nose and looked at Quinn, whimpering a little. He couldn't fix Rupert the way she was asking him to, and it didn't seem right to leave her next to her dead master. So he plucked her up, stashed her inside his coat, and ran up the stairs. Once in the water, he set himself to the oars faster than he should have, catching the water, sending it arcing. He had time. He still had time. His heart beat the same sentence over and over. The eastern sky wasn't yet turning pink. It wasn't dawn. He had time. He tried to slow down, make the oars quieter, couldn't stop himself, rowed as fast as he possibly could. He was still too late. Chapter 28 One Poutin, Two Poutin After Quinn left, Olivia waited outside the hut, her cloak wrapped close and the hood up, head tipped back against the rough planks. A light wind drifted by, carrying the scent of rotting fish and the peppery, sweet smell of crushed strawberries. The stars seemed too bright for spring. They should have been so distinct, so clear only on the coldest of winter nights. Minutes passed, until finally she knew for certain that Quinn had not come straight back, that he was waiting at Rupert's deathbed. The stars wavered above her, but tears never fell. That was a point of pride. No crying. Instead, to distract herself, she watched for a falling star though she knew it was a foolish superstition to think it proclaimed the creation of an angel. And all the time she listened for the tramp of soldiers' feet, for a burst of French jests. The men who had guarded Rupert had fallen asleep on the floor, telling her to rouse them if she heard anything. The battalion marches at the same time every morning, Togsa told her, his voice raspy with the relief of giving over Rupert's care. Still hours from now. No stars fell, but she was still watching for them when a hand clapped over her mouth and pulled her into the woods. She was too shocked even to scream. It wasn't dawn. 
There wasn't even the faintest hint of light, and there had been no cheerful French badinage, no tramp of boots to warn her. By the time she gathered her wits and began to struggle, it was too late. With one swift movement, she was pushed down and flipped onto her stomach. All those years of French tutoring stood her in good stead, though. Adonne-moi! she shrieked when the hand left her mouth. Lâchez-moi immédiatement! Coquoi! Vermine! The only response was a foul smelling scarf tied so tightly around her mouth that it jerked her head back. Still shouting, though her words were muffled, Olivia twisted, trying to kick the man pinning her to the ground, but her captor swiftly wound a rope around her wrists, hauled her upright, and gave her a rough shove. Ale! The words sounded with the ping of a fat hailstone striking a window. Then a poke between the shoulders forced her forward. Avance! She walked telling herself that Quinn would be there any moment, that the English soldiers would wake to discover her missing. She caught a glimpse of the sleeve of the man shoving her. It was ragged and blue, the kind of thick fisherman's shirt she remembered seeing on a childhood trip to Brittany. Not a soldier's uniform. Her heart was pounding so hard that she could feel the pulse in her ears. By the time they broke out of the wood, the eastern sky was lightening. They continued to walk through thick scrub, the smell of the sea keen in the wind. Olivia tried biting at the scarf in order to get it away from her mouth, but to no avail. She intentionally stumbled in an attempt to slow them down, but the man simply hauled her upright and thumped her in the back with something hard. These brutish attacks had made her back bruised and painful, and for the first time she felt truly frightened. A battalion of French soldiers was one thing. Surely they wouldn't injure a woman— even an English one. But what if this thug belonged to a gang of smugglers, or pirates, or just common criminals? The possibilities were all unpleasant. They had been following the line of the shore, winding along, when the man suddenly directed her up a small trail that led inland over some bluffs. Olivia's skirts caught on a sturdy bramble, and she stopped, thinking the man behind her would untangle her. Instead, the hard object jabbed her in the back again, and she stumbled forward, her skirt letting go of the bramble with a long ripping sound. Now her back felt as if it were on fire. Her eyes were pricked with tears, but if she hadn't wept over Rupert's death, or not much, the last thing she would cry over was this farcical situation. Not dangerous, she told herself. Rather, it was farcical. Quinn would save her, the moment he knew she was missing. The important thing was that Quinn was with Rupert. Furthermore, Rupert wasn't in that smelly hut, but in a proper bed, on the daydream, with Quinn. If there was one person she would want to sit next to her deathbed, it would be Quinn, with his honest eyes and the reassuring low bell sound of his voice. After what felt like hours, they stumbled out of the scrub and into a gravel yard, on the far side of which lay a two-story brick building, surrounded by a wall. A sentry stood at the gate in the wall. "'Who goes there?' he said, without much interest. All of a sudden, Olivia felt utterly calm. At least now she would know what was happening. They had arrived somewhere. "'A boutin using Père Bonchardzat. Her captor's voice was toneless, and accompanied by a hard prod in the direction of the gate. Olivia almost fell at the feet of the sentry. He was slim and weary, with a moustache so luxuriant that it looked as if his face had sprouted wings. "'I am not a putain!' she cried, her voice strangled by the scarf. She was fairly sure that a putain was the French word for a strumpet, a night walker. Whatever it was, she was certain that it wasn't nice. The sentry narrowed his eyes at her, and then glanced at the man behind her. What's the use of bringing her here? He wanted to know. Send her back to the village. She isn't for me or abouts, so that won't work. I don't recognize her. Olivia lifted her chin and gave the sentry a fierce stare, willing him to order the scarf removed so that she could speak. Pretty, he said, not noticing her glower, likely because he was too busy staring at her chest. Take that cloak off, Bessette. With a jerk, the cloak disappeared from around Olivia's shoulders. Plomb as a partridge.
the sentry said with a toothy smile. Are you vending your wares, madame? Furious, she shook her head. Just another wayward wife. He pulled on his moustache until his face looked lopsided. What's the world coming to? Le Capitaine or Madame Fantomas? Madame, no need to bother Le Capitaine with this one. Think we can get twenty francs of her husband for retrieving her? See this cloak? Nice maid, and it's lined. Might be petty bourgeoisie. Madame will decide. Take that scarf off her mouth, Bessette. I have to make sure she's not a spy. Le Capitaine would want to know. There was a disgusted snort from Bessette. Le Capitaine is too pickled in brandy to know what to do with a spy, even if we did find one. This is no spy. She was leaning outside Père Blanchard's hut, easy as can be, waiting for someone. You know there's only one reason a woman goes there. We should burn that hut down, the sentry said, pulling at his moustache again. Bessette started fumbling with the knotted scarf, and Olivia prepared a stream of vitriolic French, but the guard waved his hand. Just take her in to Madame Fantomas. We got some excellent hams when we found the butcher's wife bent over the apothecary's counter, remember? Tell Madame we want our normal cut. Olivia felt as if she would burst with rage. This little Madame is a fierce one, the sentry added, finally meeting her eyes. He actually fell back a step. Take her away, Bessette. I can't be seen dallying with a trollop. My wife will hear of it. Your missus is not one to cross, Bessette said with a rough chuckle. Especially if she heard what this one is like. Hips and breasts, just as a man likes them. True enough, the sentry said, his eyes lingering on Olivia's breasts. Best not to eat her like that, Bessette. She'll have her husband on you if she gets a bruise. Bessette snorted. Not after he learns where I found her. Once past the gate, rather than walk up to the building's entrance steps, they veered off to the right. Olivia was forced to duck her head as they descended a deep, damp flight of stone steps that opened straight into a large kitchen. To label the kitchen antiquated would be to pay it a compliment. It was primitive. The chamber appeared to have been carved from stone, with little attempt to smooth the walls. Two pits had been hollowed from the rock and were in use as fireplaces, with holes apparently venting to the outdoors. But it smelled like a kitchen. Chickens were going on spits, and an aroma of yeast and flour was in the air. Four or five very young men, wearing uniforms in various states of disrepair, were turning spits, sharpening knives or washing potatoes. In the very centre of the room was a long table, at which a woman was kneading a lump of dough with ferocious energy. For the first time since she'd been abducted, Olivia stopped twisting her wrists in a vain attempt to loosen the twine holding them together, and just took in the sight. Madame Fantomas, for it must be she, was like a circus embodied in one person, a big, bold pirate of a woman. Her black hair was tied up so that it rose above her head in a towering fountain, above arched eyebrows and a mouth painted crimson. She wore a low-cut gown, and over that a gore-splattered apron, the entirety lightly dusted with flour, and dangling over the gown and apron, almost to her waist, were ropes of beads, great chunks of turquoise, gold chains, even a cross. They weren't necklaces of a sort Olivia had seen before. Madame was kneading a huge glop of dough, powerful muscles flexing as she shoved forward, wrapped, and turned. After a moment she pushed it away and reached for a glass of red wine beside her, clinking her thumb rings against it. Rings adorned all her fingers, enough rings to hang a full set of bed curtains. She had the eyes of a goose Olivia had once seen run wild and peck a baker. Mad eyes. I brought you a poutin, Monsieur Bessette offered from behind Olivia's shoulder. Found her in Père Blanchard's hut, waiting for her man. Poutin, my ass, Madame said with a snort. 
Take that thing off her mouth, you fool. You've got yourself a high flyer there. Nationality to be determined. Could be for sale, but chances are she's a très coquette, having a bit on the side. Without taking her eyes off Olivia, she pinched off some raw dough and ate it. Bassett didn't bother trying to untie the scarf. He just pulled it straight off Olivia's head. There was a second of silence, then two things happened at once. Olivia burst into a violent stream of French, a commentary on Bessette, together with the illegality of kidnapping in general, while Madame Fantoma swivelled and bawled. This tastes about as good as pig slop! With that, she picked up the huge, squashy pile of kneaded dough and threw it squarely across the kitchen. Olivia broke off her tirade. The dough hit the wall and slid down, landing on the unevenly bricked floor. Feed the puta! Madame barked. They all stared. No! I am not a puta! Olivia shouted, deciding that she had to make as much noise as Madame if she wanted to be noticed. I was merely waiting for the return of my fiancé, and I don't want anything to eat! You may not be a puta, but you're a fool with an English accent. Madame said with another swig. What the devil is an English woman doing at Père Blanchard's at? Are you a spy, then? Absolutely not. Good. Because there's nothing here to spy on but a grogified captain and a bunch of French boys whose balls are too small to hold up their breeches. She waved her hand at the young men, turning the spits. I am no spy. Olivia stated. I demand to be released. My fiancé will be wondering where I am. Zaputa! Madame bellowed, turning her head and glaring at a boy at the side of the kitchen. Then she looked back at Olivia. Spy or not, what are you doing here? Because we don't get many female smugglers over here. Not that you look the type, anyway. The boy got to his feet trotted over to the side of the kitchen and plucked the top off a large earthenware container. It was oozing, bubbling, the source of the vinegary sharp smell of growing yeast. He poured it into a shallow bowl on the far end of the table. Presumably that was the poutin. I am in this country on an errand of mercy, Olivia said, keeping her head high. I am betrothed to a duke, and I demand to know on what authority this miscreant captured me and brought me here, and I want my hands freed. Six alive, a virgin, Madame said with a twist in her smile. Isn't this my lucky day? Olivia spun to face Bessette. He turned out to be a burly man with a large head and ears that stuck out like pink flower petals. You, she said furiously, Monsieur Bessette, you must undo these ropes from my hands at once. Then she turned her back to him and waggled her fingers in his direction. To her satisfaction and relief, she felt him fumbling at the twine. The mushroom, Madame commanded. The boy poured a thin stream of foul-smelling, cloudy black liquid onto the bubbling yeast and began mixing it. Treat her gently, Madame barked, apparently referring to the yeast. Not to Olivia. When Olivia's hands were free, she shook them for a moment, trying to restore their circulation. Then folded her arms over her chest and turned back to Madame. Am I to suppose that you make a habit of kidnapping women at your whim? Not unless they are worth some money. How much money do you want? Olivia demanded. For what? I assume I am to pay for my freedom. Your French is too good for a mere English maiden," Madame stated, narrowing her eyes and ignoring Olivia's comment. "You're a spy. You said it yourself. There's nothing here to spy on. True. Then you're spying on me." Olivia rolled her eyes. "Believe me, Madame. No one I know would have the faintest interest in you and your kitchen." Though it would serve nicely in an exhibit of primitive cooking amongst savages, not so," Madame said, slapping her hand down on the floury board so that a cloud rose in the air. All the great bakers of Paris and London want my recipe for bread, and you, 
You have come here, straight to the place where I am, because you know of my great talent. I know nothing about bread, Olivia stated. Then you are the savage. The great Napoleon himself said my bread was blessed by the gods, and I share my secrets of my putain with no one, no one! Her voice rose to a shriek. Olivia stood her ground. Although it might seem rather paradoxical, she was feeling quite calm now. Marauding gangs of lustful soldiers were terrifying, but battles with a lunatic cook were a routine part of running a large household. If you think anyone would try to steal the recipe for that disgusting concoction, you are quite mistaken. She is a spy, Madame announced. A cookery spy, and a terrible liar, which is true of all the English. I am not, Olivia snapped. Madame ticked off the presumed lies. A virgin? I don't think so. Olivia opened her mouth and shut it. Betrothed to a duke? Also unlikely. You're well enough, but you're no beauty. Betrothed to a draper, rather than a duke, I'd guess. She turned and hauled on a bell cord hanging at the wall. She'll have to go into the catacombs until Le Capitaine wakes up. How much did he drink last night? One of the boys turning a spit looked up. Two bottles, madame. She snorted. He'll not wake before evening, then. She pulled out a ring of keys. Put her in the far end, petit. Olivia gave the boy a look. She's a lady, he protested. Ladies don't belong in the cells. She's damned lucky they've put the guillotine to rest, Madame replied, finishing her wine. They used to do it properly in Paris. People made a living. Just whacking the heads of Aristos like I might a bean roll. Beset, go along with them. I demand to speak to whoever is in charge of this establishment, Olivia said furiously. I am, Madame stated. You! You're a servant, not the commander of a garrison. Wine! Madame bellowed. One of the boys trotted over and poured her more red wine. It's me whenever Le Capitaine is drunk or asleep, which gives him about one hour to my twenty-three. Olivia eyed her red wine. Strengthens my blood, Madame said, grinning. She reached into a sack of flour and sprinkled some on the table. Give me a bit of that, Poutin. I'm starting over. Bessette grabbed Olivia's arm, holding it hard. It's in the back with you. Do I have to tie you up again? Olivia shook her head, glaring into his pale blue eyes. My fiancé will likely kill you when he finds how you have treated me. Bessette grinned, showing blackened teeth. Won't be the first who tried. I hope you don't mind if I keep your cloak. I can sell this for ten sous. There's no need to wrench her arm, the young soldier said, stepping forward. Madame didn't look up from the flour she was delicately sifting over a small pile of frothing yeast. English Poutin, don't think you can seduce the poor lad into giving you the key to your chamber. The only way out is through my kitchen, and I don't leave my bread. Ever. Chapter 29 Lost Treasure Quinn had woken Toggs and Paisley from a sound slumber, knowing already that they had no idea what had happened to Olivia. There was no point in tearing into the exhausted Englishmen. How could they be blamed for sleeping through her disappearance after all they'd been through? Now they milled about like sleepwalkers. Quinn's heart was beating in his throat so violently that he could hardly form words— he dispatched them back to the schooner, with instructions to send Grouper back with the rowboat to wait at the top of the inlet. He paused to get his bearings, and to work out the exact location of the French garrison in relation to the hut. He started off at a steady jog, Lucy trotting at his side. Either the French soldiers had captured Olivia, or he would force them to assist in locating her. As he ran steadily up the bank, and then through a scrub forest, 
he turned over the various possibilities in his mind. Yes, England was at war with France, but that meant different things to different people, and he wasn't entirely convinced that a provincial garrison would feel much desire to capture an English lady. Though the odds of one English duke's subduing an entire garrison of French soldiers, bristling with everything from pistols to bayonets, were not good. It wouldn't be helpful to Olivia if he ended up skewered on a bayonet in a valiant but failed rescue attempt. Just then, a hare bounded across his way, and he heard a surprisingly deep bark in response. He looked down to find Lucy still running along beside him, as fast as her stubby little legs would carry her. Quinn paused, just long enough to scoop up the dog, and took off again. By his reckoning, he should be very close. Indeed, a moment later, the scrub gave out at the edge of a raked gravel yard, on the other side of which, behind walls, stood a brick structure. The garrison did not give the impression that it was prepared for military action. The gravel had been raked with no regard to a few wildflowers sprouting up here and there, waving gently in the area that appeared to have been designated for formation drills. A sentry sat at the front gate, fast asleep. Quinn walked straight past him through the courtyard and ran up the steps to the main entrance, Lucy under his arm. Inside, he put Lucy down and poked his head into a dusty receiving room, an unused office, and a long mess hall. Toward the back, he found a room that showed signs of heavy use. Open crates holding rifles lined the room, suggesting it was an armory, but he'd guessed that the worn billiards table in the center received the most attention. He headed up the staircase without meeting a soul, the click of Lucy's toenails only making the silence feel more profound. The first bedchamber he looked into, however, was occupied. For a moment, Quinn stood in the doorway, assessing the situation. A large and rather malodorous man was snoring loudly, face down on a bed whose sheets had seen better days. A table at the far wall of the room glittered with a row of brandy bottles, the same sort had given Rupert in the schooner. Thrown on the chair was a stained captain's coat. A small pistol lay on a side table. He removed its bullet and tossed the bag of powder out the open window. Then he put it back where he'd found it, caught up the back of the captain's shirt, and shook him. The man snorted and rolled on his back. Quinn recoiled as a breathful of rancid brandy reached him. Half a minute later, the captain was awake and the bed was sopping wet. Quinn had been forced to empty a water pitcher over his head, and it was only the threat of the chamber pot that actually got the man on his feet. "'Who the devil are you?' he said, his face pale grey in the sunlight, his eyes red-rimmed and dull. He reached out, steadied himself against the wall. Quinn pointed one of his pistols at the man's head. "'I have come for my fiancée. She's English.' and was abducted on the shore near here a few hours ago. Ignoring the pistol altogether, the captain sat down, shuddering like an ear of corn in the wind. No English woman would be here. We're at war with you, if you didn't notice. Did your men capture her? I doubt it. Most of them are too young to find their own winkles without a map. I need sleep. Get yourselves the devil out of here, will you? He sank back down onto the soggy bed and closed his eyes. Quinn looked around and saw a half-drunk bottle of brandy. He upended this too over the captain's head, who lurched upright, his face contorted. What the devil? he croaked. You're a madman! Find my fiancé, Quinn said, keeping his voice even. He raised the pistol and shot the first of the brandy bottles lined up on the far table, causing Lucy to flinch and then bark. Glass shards and brandy rained down onto the floor, and its heady aroma filled the room. Stop! the captain screamed. You're insane! All you English are mad as spring airs! Quinn switched pistols and shot the second bottle. I'm the madman who will have you arrested as a smuggler if you do not send your regiment out to find my fiancé. I don't care how young your men are. You will find her, or I'll destroy every bottle in the place, and I'll make sure your cosy smuggling operation dries up as well. And how would you do that, being a benighted Englishman? 
but the captain was just blustering. He was a weak and feckless type, who would always choose the path of least resistance. Sure enough, he hauled on a bell cord. A minute or so later, a very young soldier poked his head in the room, wrinkling his nose at the odour. Oui, mon capitaine. Is the regiment out on patrol? No, sir. Everyone is still resting. Quinn finished reloading and shot a third bottle. Get them up and send them down to the shore! The captain screamed to the sound of glass tinkling to the floor. Find this man's woman! Un anglaise! Mon dieu! My head is killing me! He fell back onto his bed. The young soldier saluted his moribund captain and then looked to Quinn. We're about to patrol the shore in search of smugglers, as we do every morning and afternoon, he said, without betraying by the blink of an eyelash the fact that they were standing in a smuggler's haven. We will look for your wife, sir. Good, Quinn said, biting the word off. He was aware that he was in a state of barely modulated panic. If these soldiers hadn't captured Olivia, and obviously they hadn't, then where in the bloody hell was she? He started down the stairs. He would check every house in Wizon, and then return here to see if the patrol discovered anything. The damnable thing was that he knew this particular sensation. It fell on his shoulders like a familiar but loathed garment. He had felt it when he realized that Evangeline had taken Alfie and headed for the channel. He had tasted it, bitter on his tongue, as he galloped toward Dover, hoping to intercept them on the pier. It had driven him half mad once he was there, watching the water. And he felt it now. It wasn't safe to love someone. His mother was right about that. But it was too late to avoid the condition. Chapter 30 The Princess and the... Bessette, followed by Petit, marched Olivia through a door and down a damp and chilly vaulted brick passage... It went on, wound to the left, its walls broken occasionally by solid doors with barred openings at shoulder level. "'What is this place?' Olivia asked. "'The catacombs,' the young soldier answered. "'They built the armory on top of them, and decided to use the catacombs for the kitchen and cells. "'You're at the far end. She's given you the best cell. It's got a hole in the corner.' Bessette shoved open a door to reveal a bare stone room with one rickety wooden chair lying on its side. Sure enough, there was a stinking hole in the far corner. A high, tiny window, also barred, revealed sky and a bit of grass. She was, for all intents and purposes, underground. "'You cannot leave me here,' Olivia said, grabbing his arm. "'My fiancé is a duke, and I am a lady.' I hate Le Duc, Bessette said, grinning at her again. I'm not fond of Napoleon either, but I really hate you Aristos. He shoved her in and slammed the door. He pulled the key free and handed it to Petit, who had trailed them all the way down the passage. Don't let this one seduce you into giving up the key, he advised. Madame Fantomas is not a pretty sight when she's angry. Think about her rolling pin. It won't matter what Madame thinks by the time my fiancé gets through with you, Olivia shouted. The only response was the sound of footsteps receding down the passage. Olivia took a deep breath, which was a mistake. She nearly gagged at the stench coming from the hole. Presumably she would grow accustomed to the smell in a few minutes, or perhaps fresh air would blow through the window. Perhaps pigs would fly. One had to think that by now Rupert had either rallied or not, which meant that Quinn would have returned to shore and must now be looking for her. He would be frantic. Her situation wasn't as terrible as the dire possibilities Quinn had envisioned. After all, she hadn't fallen into the hands of a garrison of soldiers thirsting for English blood. A mad breadmaker and a boozy captain didn't strike fear in her heart. If she died of anything here, it was likely to be the stench. She turned the chair over and dusted off the seat with the hem of her ruined gown, placing it in such a way that, once seated, she could see out the window. 
The grass bent at one point, and she stood on the chair to see if someone was passing, but it was only a black cat, nosing along in pursuit of a mouse. By the time the key rasped in the lock again, the light had grown stronger and taken on a yellow hue. The same young soldier, Petit, poked his head around the door. Mademoiselle, he whispered, we've prepared something better for you, at least until Mon Capitaine wakes. I'm sure he'll let you go once he realizes you're here. But no one can go against Madame Fantomas except for him. I would appreciate anywhere that doesn't include a hole, Olivia told him. Petit was probably about sixteen, though he seemed even younger. His eyes were the color of robin's eggs. We decided that French honor would not allow us to leave a lady in a room such as this, even if you are a spy. She laughed. I promise you that I'm not. As you have seen, Madame is rabid, he said, holding open the door. We don't cross her because there's no point to it, and besides, she weighs twice as much as any of us. A man named Obo pinched her once, and she struck him on the side of his head with a rolling pin. He never recovered his earring in that ear. He escorted her a short way to another cell, which had no hole, and therefore no stench. But the more salient distinction from the first cell was that against the wall under the window there was a stack of mattresses, each covered in a different rough linen ticking. The covers were striped and flowered, which made them look absurdly incongruous in the dank cell, and the stack actually reached as high as her head. A little stepladder leaned against it. We each brought a mattress down here for you, Petit said, waving at the stack. There's twenty of us, and we hauled down fourteen. We thought that was enough to keep the damp off. That was astonishingly nice of you, Olivia exclaimed. In truth, I was beginning to be very fatigued. Ladies don't belong on the ground. Maman would have killed me. May I help you? He moved next to the stepladder. Merci beaucoup, she said. She took his hand and climbed the ladder, toppling onto the highest mattress when she reached it. She came onto her knees and looked over the side. Petit's nose was level with her perch, and all of a sudden it felt rather precarious. You'd better lie down, he said, frowning. You could crack your head like an egg if you fell off. She nodded in agreement. Do you happen to know whether my fiancé... The Duke of Sconce has come looking for me. We're not allowed outdoors at this hour. I can find out at four in the afternoon when we go out for patrol. Merci, she said, but there was a noise down the passage and he backed out, slamming the barred door firmly behind him. For a moment she just sat, her head close to the stone ceiling. She was so weary that she felt dizzy. The mattresses were lumpy and uneven, but they put her on a level with a small window, which in turn was level with a patch of bright grass outside. Finally, she lay down, facing the window, and watched the grass sway. Despite the fact that there were so many mattresses, they were remarkably uncomfortable. It felt as if there was a lump at her back, as if somehow a rock had gotten mixed into the stuffing. She turned this way and that, trying to find a comfortable position that avoided the lump and would allow her to fall asleep. In the end, she curled around it, willing herself to lie very still. In her sleep, she relaxed, and so woke, hours later, with something hard poking painfully into the middle of her back. She shifted off the hard thing. It was not merely a knot of straw. It was too hard for straw and she saw that the sun had moved all the way across the room and was now striking the opposite wall. Just then, Petit pushed open the door. Hello, she called down softly. Good afternoon, mademoiselle, he held a tray. I have bought you something to eat. Madame takes a sleep in the afternoon, though unfortunately she does not leave her kitchen. He climbed up a step and handed over the tray. That's her bread he said, nodding at it. Even though Madame is completely mad, there are bakers in Paris who would love to know what she puts in her boudin. Goodness, Olivia said, adding anxiously, do you know if the Duke has asked for me? 
Petit nodded. His eyes were twinkling. Mon capitaine was forced out of bed by him, and he never rises before evening. Your duke fairly tore the place apart. Unfortunately, le capitaine had no idea you were here. Olivia groaned. Did the duke leave? Yes, but he will return in an hour or so. Le capitaine promised to send out the patrol to try to find you before he went back to bed. Besset plans to demand fifty guineas of your duke, but madame says you might be worth a hundred. In that case, I'll be out by nightfall. How is your mattress? Petty asked, a quizzical look on his face. While I wouldn't wish to seem ungrateful, I'm a bit afraid of falling off. May I ask why you put quite so many on top of each other? He turned red and suddenly looked even younger. We thought that it looked too much like a bed with just one or two mattresses. It is a bed. Yes, but if it looked like a bed, there was the chance that Bessette might decide to... He waved his hand, embarrassed. You'd be there, you see, on a bed, but this way it is difficult to reach you. You are brilliant, Olivia said sincerely. If there are any coins to be given out, I shall make sure that they come in your direction. He grinned. It was my idea, but we did it, all of us. So, is it comfortable up there, my lady? The mattress is smooth? Of course, Olivia said, rather less than truthfully. She hesitated and then asked, Aren't you rather young to be a soldier? I'm almost sixteen, he said stoutly, but then he added with a little droop to his lips. Nothing ever happens in this garrison, because Le Capitaine is interested only in brandy. My mother forced me to be here rather than join a proper regiment. He looked disgusted. Olivia smiled at him. I think your mother is very wise. Petit! Time for review! The words echoed down the long stone corridor. What is needed is a distraction that might cause Madame to leave her kitchen, he said, his brown eyes now sparkling. Something that will disrupt the garrison before your duke hands beset those guineas he is demanding. He grinned. I shall think on it. He disappeared, slamming the door behind him. Olivia heard the lock slide into place. A distraction? What good would that do, unless she could escape from this cell? She ran her hand over the uneven mattress, thinking about the light in Petit's eyes. One could almost think that he had tried to drop a hint about her mattresses. Carefully, she slid her legs over the side and stood on the stepladder. She slipped her hand between the first two mattresses, but she could still feel the lump beneath her fingers. She tried the next two, and the two before that. It was a key. A key tucked between the mattresses, a big iron key that looked exactly like the one the young soldier had used to enter her cell. A smile spread across her face. She would wait for Petit to create the distraction he had promised, and then walk straight out of the building and into Quinn's arms. And if Madame Fantomas tried to stop her on the way through the kitchen, she'd thump her on the head with a rolling pin. A bellow sounded down the corridor. Spy! What do you think of my bread? Olivia grinned. I've had better, she shouted back. Puta! Chapter 31 The Bark of Cerberus Quinn was murderous, exhausted, and on the verge of sheer panic by the time he reached the village of Wisson. Lucy was as tired as he was, so he was carrying her tucked inside his jacket which wasn't comfortable for either of them. And then it transpired that no one had heard anything of Unon Glaze, though they knew that some English soldiers, one of them gravely wounded, had been living in Père Blanchard's hut. The soldiers were not hurting anyone, the smith told Quinn, arms folded over his formidable chest. Yes, they were English, he shrugged. So are you. I would guess that Bisset scooped up your woman. Quinn's eyes narrowed. Beset? 
a warthog of a schemer. He'll have handed her over to Madame Fantomas, and he'll want a reward. Where will I find this Madame Fantomas? He snorted. Where else? The garrison. Right under the nose of that drunken sot. Don't you speak against Le Capitaine, the smith's wife said, suddenly appearing in the door behind him. He's keeping our boys safe. She eyed the shock of white hair falling over Quinn's brow. Touched by an angel, were you? By the devil, more like, he answered. He headed back to the garrison, a few furlongs up the road from the village. He didn't think he'd ever been so fatigued or so filthy in his life. His hair ribbon was long lost. Every inch of his clothing was caked with dust, or worse. But when questioning the villagers, all that dirt had worked to his advantage. It had the distinct impression that while they might not have been eager to help a member of the aristocracy, no matter the nationality, the look and dress of a madman had fit right in. When he reached the garrison, the sentry had woken up. I want my fiance, Quinn said, dispensing with the preliminaries. I can tell you who has her, but I should have something for my pains. He pulled nervously at his moustache. Quinn leaned toward the man and spoke in a voice that was calm but lethal. I've had a long day. Your pains. I would be happy to rip your head from your shoulders, and then you will forget your pains. Bissette is waiting for you around the building, the sentry blurted out, jerking back. Transaction concluded, Quinn walked around the side of the garrison, one pistol at the ready and the other stuck in his waistband. Here! A low voice called to him from the trees. Lucy was sniffing at one of the windows, set close to the ground. Come, he called to her, walking toward the woods. She ignored him, barking at some invisible quarry. A rat, no doubt. He started toward her, but a burly man stepped from the shade of the wood. The smith was right. Warthog suited him. You have my fiancé, Quinn growled, leaving Lucy to her rat and striding over to him. Something about the look in Quinn's eye must have unnerved him, because he stopped grinning and rubbed his hands together. You'll need to pay me fifty guineas for my protection, he said briskly. She was waiting around Père Blanchard's hut. We always receive a share when we pick a woman up wandering about where she doesn't belong, between men. That's not even to mention the fact that no English are allowed on these shores, as I hope you know. Quinn let his hand draft back to the butt of his pistol. I don't have it. Bassett shifted his stance, just enough to show that he too was armed. His little warthog eyes glinted. I'll ask you to fetch the sum before I hand over your woman. If I return to England to raise that sum, there's no guarantee that I'll be able to come back immediately, Quinn pointed out. Nations at war tend not to have regular ferry service. Bassett spat out his soggy cigar at Quinn's feet, narrowly missing. Boards go back and forth every day, so you'll be back by morning. If you give something toward a keep, we won't introduce her to the pleasures that only French— Quinn's left hand shot out, and he twisted Bassett's scarf around his throat so quickly that the man didn't have a chance to gasp. He watched dispassionately as Bassett's bulbous face reddened to a beet color. There was some sort of hubbub going on behind him, but he didn't want to risk turning his head. Instead, he watched Bassett's face for a slackness that would indicate he was near expiration for lack of air. When it came, he eased his grip. My fiancé. Now. Bassett gargled. Quinn couldn't make out what he was saying. For one thing, strangled French was none too easy to understand. And for another, Lucy was barking furiously somewhere behind him. Likely the soldiers had returned from their useless patrol. With his free hand, he pulled the pistol from Bassett's breeches and threw it to the ground, shoving his own into the small folds of the man's stomach. You're a petty blackmailer, if not worse, and I'm convinced the village would be better off without you. He tightened the scarf again. He waited for a bit 
and then relaxed his grip just enough so that Bissette could make pleading noises. Where is she? Madame Fantomas, Bissette said, his voice a whisper. But his eyes shifted. Quinn noted the twitch, calculated the probabilities, and moved to the side just as Bissette attempted to knee him in the groin. Where will I find Madame? Behind him, Lucy was barking again. Catacombs, Bissette gasped. Then he crumpled. Quinn let go of the scarf, allowing him to fall to his knees, but he kept his weapon trained on the man's head. Madame Fantomas, put her in the catacombs. Bissette's shoulder moved, just a twitch. The fool was planning another attack. One swift and well-aimed kick with Quinn's boot, and the man rolled on the ground instead, hands between his legs, sobbing with a high-pitched squeal. Where are the catacombs? Quinn demanded. He scooped up Bissette's pistol to empty the chamber. Then he froze, realizing he smelled smoke. He spun around to find that thick smoke was billowing out of the small windows flush with the ground. No wonder Lucy had been barking. Something was on fire. Damn it! He didn't have time for this. He had to find the catacombs. But Bissette had scurried into the woods the moment he'd turned his back. Quinn briefly considered giving chase, but he was likely needed to help with the fire. The drunken captain certainly didn't seem capable, if indeed he had made it out of bed. He ran around the side of the building, ducking to avoid the cloud of black smoke pouring from the windows. It had an acrid, deeply unpleasant odor, as if putrid water had caught on fire. Lucy raced ahead of him, and the sight of her brought an idea to mind so terrible that he almost stumbled. It couldn't be that Lucy had been barking at Olivia, which would mean that the catacombs were below the garrison. He burst into the courtyard to find it full of soldiers darting here and there chaotically. No one seemed to be making a concerted effort to put out the fire. The captain was standing at the top of the steps, bellowing and waving his arms. His men were trotting out the front door, carrying out crates that clinked gently. It seemed the brandy took first priority. A hand caught Quinn's arm. Sir, sir. He turned. A young and very frightened soldier stood before him, face blackened with soot. She's in there, the boy panted. Past the kitchens. She was supposed to come out when I got Madame to leave her kitchen. She had the key, but she hasn't come, and I couldn't get through the smoke. The boy was pointing, hand shaking, to a doorway from which smoke billowed like a sheet in the wind. The catacombs, he gasped. She's in the catacombs, and there's no other exit. Quinn looked in time to see Lucy race under the smoke and disappear through the door. A curse ripped from his lips as he pulled off his coat and jerked sharply on his linen shirt sleeve, tearing it off. Ignore that bloody captain and his brandy, he shouted at the boy. You must put out the fire. Organize the men. Without waiting for a response, he tied the sleeve around his nose and mouth and lunged down the steps, bent double to avoid the thickest smoke. Olivia, 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 Olivia. It felt as if the very beat of his heart was sending her name coursing through his body. At the bottom of the stairs, he squinted, able to see just enough to realize that he was in a kitchen. Past the kitchen, the boy had said. He saw smoke pouring from a chimney on fire, likely feeding on years of grease. He couldn't see a door, but he heard Lucy bark somewhere to his right. He moved in that direction, half blind and choking, toward the bark. If anything, the smoke was worse in the passage he found. He shouted Olivia's name, took in a lungful of smoke, reeled, and nearly fell. He flattened himself on the pavement, turning his head so his cheek was against the cool stone, and was rewarded with a gulp of relatively clean air. Holding his breath, he thrust up and forward, flattened himself again, took another breath. By now, he'd inhaled enough smoke that it felt as if the fire was in his lungs, not the chimney. But Olivia was here, somewhere. Five years before, he had not entered the channel's frigid, treacherous waters to save Alfie. He could not have saved Alfie, but he could make it down this bloody passage, and he would not allow another person he loved to die gasping for air. Another gulp of air, and he heaved himself forward again, trying, against his body's protests, to think. He had to find Olivia and get her to one of those windows. They were tiny, too small to push her through, 
but if he could hoist her up to the window on his shoulders, she would be able to breathe. Air on the ground was damnably short, even with his nose pressed against the stones. In fact, the relentlessly calculating part of his brain informed him that he would die in minutes if he did not breathe some fresh air. Another breath, the bleak truth of it came with tingling in his extremities. He would not survive this. He would not find Olivia, nor save her. His lungs burned, telling their own story. Still, at least this time he knew that he had given it his all. He hadn't stood, powerless on the dock. He had thrown himself into the water. He forced himself to crawl forward again, and then he heard a strangled woof. He reached out, thinking he'd touch fur, and felt a bare arm instead, a limp arm. A window! He had to get her to a window. Indeed, he had to get them both to a window. He felt up her arm, panting her name, but had to stop in order to dip his head to the stone floor once again. He sucked up whatever he could, choked, tried again. Olivia was lying face down, which might have saved her. He refused to think about the other possibility. She lay halfway across a threshold. He tried to peer into the room, but oily black smoke obscured everything. But Lucy had barked at a window. Without further thought, Quinn took another breath, then he staggered up and hauled Olivia's slack form into the room. His body overruled him in a desperate attempt to find air. Dropping Olivia, he sucked in a gulp of smoke and doubled over, coughing so hard that he felt as if his ribs would break. Black dots floated before his eyes, and he stumbled forward, hitting some sort of soft pallet. He leaned against it for a second, trying to gather strength. He knew the window was up there. If he could hoist Olivia onto this thing, he could put her face close to it. They would have to abandon the little air there was at ground level. But the logical part of his brain registered that his loss of vision wasn't only due to the smoke. His sight was closing down along with his lungs. They would not survive unless they got to that window. He crouched down, took in a breath, managed to roll Olivia's limp body over his shoulder, and staggered to his feet. It was a sign of his diminished mental power that he felt no surprise when a ladder appeared just where he needed it. He put a foot on the lowest rung. Lucy! He propped Olivia against the ladder, reached down and felt fur, picked up the dog by the scruff of her neck. The black dots were swirling now, like a storm coming in at sea. How much time did he have before unconsciousness? A minute? Less? He snatched Olivia's skirt, dropped Lucy into it, and stuffed the fold of cloth into his mouth, holding the dog between them. He forced his second foot onto the ladder. His thighs felt like steel bars, inflexible and impossibly heavy, but he pushed himself up and up again, until at last he toppled Olivia on top of the pallet. There was the window. Bless you, Lucy, he thought. Lucy rolled free, scrambled to her feet, and tottered toward the fresh air. Quinn sucked in one lungful and then pulled Olivia across the pallet, putting her mouth next to the bars. She had not moved. She was utterly limp. Dead, he thought. She was dead. Come on, Olivia, he said his voice coming in a rasp. Breathe, damn it! Breathe! But her face lolled against the bars. He could see no signs of life. A tearing pain seized him. His heart was cracking, breaking right there in the smoky room. Don't leave me! he shouted hoarsely. He grabbed her shoulders and shook her hard. Don't leave me! As his vision cleared, he could see that Olivia's face was faintly blue. He suddenly remembered to feel for a heartbeat, but when he pressed his hand to her chest, he couldn't feel anything. Then he realized he was trying to find a heartbeat on the wrong side of her body. My brain's garbled, he mumbled. Then, fiercely, you must breathe. He shook her again, willing her to open her eyes, but her head fell back like a blossom on a broken stem. Her face swam in front of his eyes and he realized that he was crying, his hands moving over her chest, trying to find a heartbeat that wasn't there. Lucy was there too, barking hoarsely at her mistress's ear. But Olivia did not move. She would never move again. He lowered his face to her neck, trying to smell that wonderful elusive perfume that was Olivia, 
but all he could smell was smoke. Something twisted hard inside his chest, and all the grief he had never expressed came boiling up, sobs rising so hard that his body jerked as if he were having a seizure. There was no stopping these cries. The world turned into a black, swirling hole of grief. Alfie, Olivia, even Evangeline and Rupert, they were all dead. Howls tore through him, bringing with them words that he had never spoken aloud, because a duke is always controlled. A duke never pleads. This duke pleaded. Please, God, help! Help! Finally he realized that he could see Lucy licking Olivia's cheek. The room was clearing of smoke. The chimney fire must have been extinguished. Lucy uttered a bark that sounded like a low bell, like that of a great Dane. The bark of Cerberus, the dog who guards the gates of Hades, perhaps. His last sob brought with it a strange clarity, a deep calm. I cannot bear it, Quinn said, talking to the thin air. I cannot bear this again. He couldn't go back to his sterile house, to the pages of mathematical equations, to his mother's strictures. Without Olivia and Alfie, there was no point in living. Lucy was still licking Olivia's cheek. He reached to push her away, and he thought he saw Olivia shudder. He grabbed her shoulders and lifted her toward him. Please, Olivia, breathe, please. Nothing. He pulled her body against his and rocked back and forth, those damned tears falling again. She coughed. Tarquin Brook Chatfield, Duke of Sconce, made a fool of himself that night in France. He always remembered it and looked back with a tinge of embarrassment. The man who never cried, not even at his own son's funeral, wept. And when Olivia Mayfair Lytton came to, coughing and hurting, but otherwise fine, she, who never cried either, wept as well. Chapter 32 A Warrior and an Amazon It was the mattresses, Olivia told Petit two hours later. She was sitting on a chair in the middle of the courtyard, taking deep breaths of fresh, sea-scoured air. Her chest ached, but it was already feeling much better. A steaming hot bath had helped. Your mattresses saved our lives. But his eyes were agonized. It was I, I who almost cost you your life. I blocked the chimneys to force Madame to leave the kitchen, and then one of them caught on fire. By the time I realized you had not used your key, I couldn't get through the smoke. I failed. It was an accident. Olivia told him. But you must promise never to do something so dangerous again. I will not, Petty gasped. Never, never, never. You can make up for it, Quinn said, appearing at his shoulder. Carry Lucy to the rowboat next to Père Blanchard's hut, if you please. He handed over the little dog. She's too tired to walk with us. Give her to a sailor named Grouper, who should be waiting. I will run all the way, Petty said, suiting action to word and tearing out the front gate. My goodness, Olivia watched him go. One of Lucy's ear was just visible, blowing backward in the wind. Lucy must feel as if she's in a race. Petty is taking the road, Quinn said. We'll cut through the woods, and we should meet him not long after he arrives, even given his gallop. He bent and picked her up in one smooth movement. Time to go home. You mustn't, Olivia protested. You can't. I weigh too much. But he merely pressed a kiss on her forehead and walked out of the courtyard, leaving the sordid garrison behind. His body ached, but he never gave way to fatigue. It was half a league to the inlet where the rowboat waited for them, but the Duke's muscles seemed to be made of steel. Olivia was quiet, her arms around his neck her cheek against his chest, so grateful to be with him and alive that she couldn't speak. But when he walked through the woods and she heard the sound of running water, she insisted on being put down. We're almost at the daydream, Quinn protested. 
I want to get out of this bloody country. She ran a hand along his cheek. Please? He groaned, but he put her on her feet. It was early evening, and the air was warm and smelled of flowers. Bluebells stretched down to the edge of a lazy stream lined by young oaks. They're so beautiful, Olivia breathed, kneeling in a patch of blossoms. Quinn just growled. Enjoy them now, because you won't see these flowers again. We are never returning to France. She laughed. Of course we will return, after the war is over. I want to meet Petit's bride some day, and learn if the drunken capitaine sobers up. Besides, I heard you making plans for Cognac to be sent to Littlebourne Manor on a regular basis. The best I've had in years. Quinn looked unrepentant. I hate to say it, but Madame's bread was astonishingly good. Worth a trip to France. Her voice trailed off as she looked up at him. Quinn had bathed as well, and washed away the streaks of black soot that made him look like a thief in the night. Even so, there was something different about him. The cheekbones that seemed aristocratic in England now seemed harsh and undomesticated. He wore no coat, and one shirt sleeve had been ripped away, bearing his muscular arm. He was the embodiment of an avenger. What? he asked, scowling down at her. You look like a warrior, she said, her whole body thrilling in a distinctly uncivilized way to the barely suppressed violence pulsing in his every sinew. He crouched beside her, and his thigh muscles bulged in a way that made her long to run her fingers over them. A lady would never notice that. Her mother would be scandalized, and she could not have cared less. I thought I had lost you, he said, his voice stark and uncompromising. It turned me into a madman, so I should probably warn you that I may never be the same again, Olivia. She came up on her knees so that her eyes were level. My last thought before I fainted was of you. I knew you would come. I love you, Quinn. I never understood much about love, he said, not touching her. But I do know that I love the way you hold your own against my mother. And your bad jokes, and your silly limericks, and your violet dress. And the way you can climb a tree and fly a kite. She smiled. That was good enough. My mother told me long ago, he continued, that it was a good thing that we were an unemotional family, because love was dangerous. I proved her hypothesis by falling in love with Evangeline. Olivia bit her lip, ready to argue. But I love you. So much more. His voice grated and nearly broke, but he steadied it. I love you more than anything in this world, more than my own life. If love is dangerous, then I don't want to live in safety. His voice was rough and savage and doubly honest for its hunger. Olivia shifted backward, still on her knees. Just looking at you makes me ache. Here. She put a hand on her stomach, let it drift lower. And here. His face changed from deadly to sensual. Olivia. He breathed the word, then... No. He tried to make the word into a command, but she was pretty sure that warriors married Amazons, which meant it was time she became as bold as any Amazon. Not that history was her strong point. I'm not afraid when you are with me. She undid the top button of a villager's dress, kindly given to replace her ruined traveling costume. I'm not afraid of Berset because I saw what you did to him back at the fortress. Quinn's jaw clenched. Unfortunately, I think the bastard will survive. If I had known that he had given you those bruises, I would have beaten him to within an inch of his life the first time I encountered him. She smiled and slipped free two more buttons. And I'm not afraid of French soldiers, because all the ones around here are your cousin Justin's age, 
though they might not be quite as poetic. I wouldn't be surprised if Petit returns to his room to scribble verses to an English moon goddess. He was watching her hands. Olivia undid the last button and eased the gown over her shoulders. Most of all, she said, coming to her feet, I'm no longer afraid of myself, of my own body. The gown pulled at her feet, leaving only a chemise. No, corset, he growled, not moving. I'm going to destroy all your corsets when we reach England. What's wrong with a corset? she asked, teasing him by slowly, slowly inching up the hem of her chemise. Holds you in, he said, his eyes flaring. I can't stand to see your curves confined. She knew her smile was radiant. She felt not even a tinge of embarrassment as she pulled her chemise over her head and tossed it aside. Quinn froze. A muscled, wild man crouched at her feet. She simply waited in that patch of French bluebells, a ray of dusky sunshine playing on her breasts and stomach, and let him look as long as he wished. To be strictly honest, she did position her legs in the best possible fashion, knees together, bent slightly to the side. She had never felt more sensual or more desirable, being naked in the outdoors even though, or perhaps especially because, Quinn was still clothed, was intoxicating. Her whole body softened with desire, sang with it. Still, he didn't move that new, ferocious demeanour clinging to him. Olivia, he growled finally. Yes, he may be ferocious, but she was a woman, his woman. She saw the fire blazing in his eyes and the way his hands were trembling for her. Move your legs apart. She shifted into the immodest pose he wanted, and even that didn't embarrass her. You're perfect, he said hoarsely, and you're mine. All of a sudden, strong arms circled her hips, and a swipe of his tongue between her legs made her shriek. Like honey, he said, taking another lick that made her gasp. A sweet, insistent ache spread quickly down her legs, and Olivia wound her fingers into the clean silk of his hair and hung on. Quinn took his time, holding her upright after her legs lost strength, his hands digging into the voluptuous curves of her ass, his tongue as demanding as the rest of him. He didn't stop until she was sobbing with pleasure, shaking all over, trying to speak but unable to find words. He rose to his feet and ripped his shirt over his head. A moment later she found herself on her back in a heap of discarded clothing and bluebells, a naked, hard body looming over her, but his jaw was clenched, eyes worried. I can't stop myself, Olivia, and it might still hurt. But she was already arching toward him, her hands clenching on his forearms. I feel empty, she whispered. I want you inside me. He reached down with one hand and closed his eyes for a moment. You're so ready, his voice rasped. Oh, she cried, pushing against his finger, against the rough stroke of his thumb. I, can you, yes. The golden sunshine hurled into her again, streaking along her veins. Quinn waited through the spasms that shook her, then reared back and put his huge hands under her bottom. His face was desperate, but still wary. I want your, she said but had to stop for a shaky breath. A gleam of laughter lightened his eyes. Don't you dare say anything about a battering ram, Olivia Lytton. She pouted at him, loving the way his eyes caught on her plump lips. But I want it. And she meant it. If possible, he felt even larger than the first time. But it was all different. She shrieked when he thrust home, and not from pain. Her legs instinctively rose and clenched around his hips, holding him fast. A low cry tore from his lips. Not, not so fast, he gasped.
he came down on his elbows and kissed her. I love you. The words came out low and fierce, a warrior's vow. He drew back, thrust again, stopped. There's no reason to live without you, Olivia. None. Her lips trembled and her eyes swam with tears, but he bent his head, caught her mouth again. No tears, he said. You lived. I lived. We lived. I love you, she said, her hands trembling as she tried to pull him even closer. I love you so much, Quinn. Their eyes met. Please, she gasped, not really certain what she was begging for. But Quinn knew. He came home to her, and she took what he gave her, took it, and gave it back. Chapter 33 The Merits of Simple Words Quinn did not find the right words until they had washed in the stream and put their clothes back on, but for once it didn't bother him that the words he wanted didn't come immediately. What he and Olivia felt was more than language. It was like light, he realized, something plain and simple that split into a rainbow when examined closely. You have changed my heart, he said at last. I'll never be comfortable without knowing where you are. The shimmer in Olivia's eyes threatened to spill over again, but she was safe and in his arms. He began to walk, bending his head to kiss away a tear or two. There was still a long tramp through the forest to the inlet overhung by trees, and he hadn't slept in two days, but Olivia's whispers gave him strength, and everything she told him, even the silliest of limericks, really meant only one thing. She loved him, that cold and unemotional man whom Evangeline had declared unlovable. When they reached the rowboat, Grouper was asleep on the riverbank, Lucy curled up under his arm, and the world, Quinn's world, was in place, and would be, for the rest of his life. When their carriage drew up at Littlebourne, followed by another, which was hung with black and carried Rupert's body, the household poured out to greet them. The Duke of Canterwick, still unsteady from his bout of unconsciousness, clung to their hands, thanked them over and over for bringing his boy home, and then left a broken man. The Dowager Duchess of Sconce broke her most cherished commandment as regards a lady's composure, and burst into tears in plain sight of the entire household. Miss Georgiana Lytton screamed, grabbed her sister, and shook her. It hardly need be said that an outburst of sobbing, happy hysteria indicates that a person has, if only momentarily, cast aside precepts such as, Your demeanour should ever augment your honour. It was a good thing that Georgie and Olivia's parents were not there to see the general laws of the universe dispensed with, at least to Mrs. Lytton's mind. Poor Mrs. Lytton would have been even more shocked if she had overheard the conversation between her daughters later in the day. But you cannot bear Lady Cecily for more than a half hour. You'll be driven mad by within a week. Don't you remember the trip here, when you and I— It doesn't matter, Georgiana said firmly. Lady Cecily's nephew is an Oxford Don, Olivia. A Don! Olivia put down her teacup and eyed her sister. Being a Don must be a good thing. Georgiana ignored that. She was bubbling with excitement in a very un like fashion. Mr. Holmes begins a series of lectures on Laplace's Mechanique Celeste and Newton's Principia next week. Women are not allowed to attend such lectures, but he obviously cannot deny his own aunt. And her companion. But Georgie, are you quite certain you can endure it? Remember, Lecturing seems to be a family trait. You're facing hours of Lady Cecily's opinions regarding digestive processes. Lady Cecily is very kind, Olivia. Just think, she's going to sit through those lectures for my sake. She's going to do exactly what I would do in that situation, and sleep through. If I had to be a companion to a murderer in order to go to those lectures, I would, 
Georgiana said with conviction. You raise an interesting question, Olivia said mischievously. Could it be that the sainted Mr. Bum Trinket, late husband of Lady Cecily herself, died a questionable death? Perhaps from a potion bought from a Venetian quack? Olivia, Georgiana said, shocked as always. Worse, what if you are driven to homicide? Stop that, you are being quite improper. There was a talkative old woman named Bum Trinket, who natted day and night like a cricket. Olivia laughed, dancing out of the way as her sister made a grab at her sleeve. Her tongue never ceasing was vastly displeasing until her companion smacked her bum with a picket. You reprobate! The perfect princess actually chased the imperfect princess clear around the library settee before she remembered that dignity, virtue, affability and bearing precluded bodily assault. Olivia's world, like Quinn's, was firmly in place. Georgie might be going off to Oxford and eschewing the life of a duchess, but the tattered shreds of the duchification program clung to her, and Olivia was about to fulfil her mother's dearest hope, although it could be said that her success was directly tied to the failures of the very same program. Quinn and Olivia walked behind the Duke of Cantwick when Rupert was buried with honours, not in the family tomb, but in Westminster Abbey, as befitted an English hero who trailed clouds of glory. His place was marked by a very simple marble tablet engraved with his name and a fragment of an odd poem. A few years later, a young poet named Keats stood puzzling over the inscription one long afternoon. Sometime after that, a middle-aged poet named Auden found himself fascinated by it for a whole week. Fifty years later, an erudite dissertation discussed the complexities of fragmentation, but that was all in the future, a puzzle that lay ahead for those interested in twists of language. For Tarquin Brook Chatfield, Duke of Sconce, complicated words never had the same incantatory force as they had before his second marriage. He never worried if he couldn't find just the right ones. There were only three that truly mattered and they bore repeating, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Epilogue Thirteen years later, the young girl had ebony hair with a shock of white over her brow. Lady Penelope Brooke Chatfield didn't know it yet, although at age twelve she was beginning to guess. But she was the most beautiful lady of her age between Kent and London, and even beyond. Cherry lips, high cheekbones, and the scream of an Amazon. It all adds up, Quinn mumbled. She's going to be a terror. They'll line up begging to marry her, and then we'll have to give her poor husband hardship pay. Pish, Olivia said lazily enjoying the way the summer heat hung in the air, even in the shade of their favourite elm tree, the one at the end of Ladybird Ridge. Small white butterflies danced below its lowest branches. Penelope ran by, chasing one of her cousins with a shriek that reminded one of the new steam engines. My papa is too, she screamed. My papa is fierce. You don't look fierce, Olivia said twining her hands into Quinn's hair. He lay on the quilt next to her, whispering things into the tummy that rose in the air between them. I'm being nice to the new baby, he said, dropping a kiss in the appropriate place. I'm saving all my ferocity for Penelope's first suitors. A scrambling noise could be heard in the tree above them. Be careful, Quinn called. Mama is here, and you must be particularly careful these days, you know. I know. There had been lots of rain this summer, and the tree was thick with dark leaves. Thin legs emerged from the canopy and waved for a moment until Quinn got his feet, took hold of their owner, and placed his son safely on the ground. Papa! Penelope screeched, running back toward them, her hair streaming in the wind. She must have lost another ribbon. 
Aunt Georgie says that you haven't killed any pirates, so come and tell her that you do it all the time. You really must give her a better understanding of what a local militia can and cannot do, Olivia murmured. Quinn put his hands on his hips and shouted, Tell Georgiana that it's Uncle Justin who is good at rounding up pirates. Penelope arrived in a flurry of long legs and silky hair. She grabbed his hand. That's absurd, Papa. You know that Uncle Justin is too busy singing. If you wished to kill a pirate, you could do it before breakfast. Come tell Aunt Georgie that. And she dragged him away. Master Leo Rupert, who held the title of Earl of Calderon, though he didn't know it yet, fell onto his knees beside his mother and showed her a little collection of twigs, all broken off at precisely the same length. Leo was imaginative, dreamy, and much quieter than Penelope. He was always thinking as hard as he could, harder than most five-year-olds. "'Will you build something with the twigs?' Olivia asked, pushing herself into a sitting position. "'Perhaps a house?' "'I'm too young to build a house,' Leo said, with just a shadow of annoyance. "'People my age don't build houses, Mamma. You should know that. He stowed the twigs carefully in his pocket and got up from his rather grubby knees. What will you do with them? Alfie and I will build a road. I'll ask Uncle Justin if he will help us. Then he gave her a smile that was all the more beautiful for being quite grave and rarely used. Where's Lucy? She's sitting in the pony cart, Olivia told him. You know Lucy doesn't like leaving Grandmother's knee these days. I shall show these sticks to Grandmother, he said, and wandered off. Olivia watched him go, wondering. Her husband returned and sat down just behind her, spreading his hands over her belly and pulling her against his warm chest. This baby is bigger than either of the other two, he observed. Quinn... Do you think it's truly all right that Leo plays with a friend named Alfie all the time, and no one can see Alfie but him? Quinn pulled her even more snugly against him and kissed her ear. Do you think he does it simply because it makes his papa so happy? Olivia tipped her head back against his shoulder. No. Leo would say that Alfie is his own friend, just as he has said many a time over the last year. As for the size of my belly, I begin to think I might be carrying twins. You're carrying twins? Quinn exclaimed. Could you rethink that idea? I'm not sure we can handle two more. Olivia laughed. Is this the same man who said he wanted the nursery full of children? That was before I knew how loud they can be. With Georgiana's two and Justin's boy arriving tomorrow... And you know that child is a perfect terror, Olivia. The house shakes at its foundations. Kiss me, Olivia asked, looking up at her beautiful warrior prince of a husband. His first kiss was adoring, but it gradually deepened and turned into something else. A possessive, marauding kiss. His hands edged from her tummy up toward her chest, a softer and more voluptuous curve. You mustn't, Olivia said with a little gasp some time later. They were both breathing quickly. Let's go home, Quinn said into her ear. I want you. I want my wife on a Sunday afternoon in a sultry, sunny English summer. I want her naked and lying on our bed so that I can... Penelope skittered to a halt beside them. Are you kissing again? Grandmother says it's time to go home, and Nanny says that there are lemon tarts for tea. Come on! She ran ahead, her half-boots twinkling under her skirts. Quinn helped his beloved to her feet, took her hand, and entertained her all the way back to the pony cart, with so many whispered suggestions that she was quite rosy when they at last reached the end of Ladybird Ridge. Huh, <sighs> the dowager said, seeing Olivia's face. Too hot out here, I shouldn't wonder. Lucy is overheated as well. Quinn bent down and gave Lucy's ear a tug. Then we must go home, he said, nodding to the groom driving a second cart, now full of his children and their cousins. He took the reins of the pony cart. We mustn't discomfort Lucy. 
and I think my wife would also be the better for. Olivia elbowed him. A nap, he said, kissing her nose. The Dowager Duchess looked at both of them, and then away at the neat fields that spread out from the seat of the sconces. It was not every day that she thanked God that she had chosen Georgiana to undergo that absurd series of tests she had devised, and that Georgiana had brought along Olivia. But almost every day. This is Susan Dewarden. We hope you have enjoyed this unabridged recording of The Duke is Mine by Eloisa James. This program was produced by Tantor Media Incorporated. Executive Producer Karen Jakonski. Text Copyright 2012 by Eloisa James. Production Copyright 2012 by HarperCollins Publishers. All rights reserved. Thank you for listening. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.